I'm Rich Gassaway. I'm now retired fire chief. I spent 30 years in the fire service, 10 years in my hometown just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 10 years in Ohio serving as a fire chief in a community that borders Akron, Ohio, and then Minnesota where I live now, spent 10 years as a fire chief in a community that borders Minneapolis and St. Paul, and retired in 2009. Backing up five years, in 2004, I went back to school and earned a PhD studying cognitive neuroscience. Now that sounds kind of, um, kind of a heady topic, but let me tell you why I chose that topic. I was, uh, I was planning, first planning for my retirement to think, well, I'll teach at a college and that'll help me get the job. And that never, never worked out. I never end, did end up teaching at a college. Mm -hmm. But I, there were some things that were kind of eating at me that I wanted to try to get some answers to. And I thought doing research might help me to find the answers to those, to those issues that I had been faced throughout my career. All along the way, while I was serving as a firefighter and an officer and a chief, I became a student of line of duty death reports and spent a lot of time trying to understand how firefighters get hurt and killed. And there are a lot of lessons contained in those line of duty death reports. And as I was reading them and watching videos and reading case studies, I found myself asking a question that I could not answer. And it wasn't a hard question. It was a very simple question. And I asked, my, I asked it to myself over and over and over again. And I just could never come up with a good answer. And I thought if doing research might help me to come up with the answer to that question that had plagued me for almost 30 years, I might discover something that the fire service finds some value in. And the question was simply this. When those firefighters were working in their high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments at emergency scenes, and things were going bad, and somebody was going to get killed, how could they not see it coming? That was the question. Time and time and time again when I read those case studies, I wondered how could they not see this coming? There were so many clues and signs and indicators that this incident that they were operating at was going to end in a disaster. But for some reason, they couldn't see it. It was like they were blind to what was happening right in front of them. How could they be so blind to the things happening right in front of them that were so obvious to me? And I'm not talking about one firefighter that was blind. Sometimes it seemed like the whole company of firefighters were blind. Sometimes it seemed like the whole incident scene was blind. Like no one operating there could see what was happening, could see the tragedy unfolding. Now, as I was reading those case studies, I had a benefit. I knew something that everybody operating at that incident scene did not know. I knew the outcome. I knew that somebody was going to be dead by the time I got to the end of the report. When they were at those scenes and the things were playing out in real time, they didn't know that. They didn't know it was going to end in tragedy. But by knowing that in advance, it gave me an advantage. I had the benefit of something called hindsight bias, which meant as I was looking through the report, it made it easier for me to see the things that were tracking to the tragic ending, because I knew the outcome already. As those things were happening in real time at the incident, it was not so obvious to them that this clue and this clue and this clue meant that we were going to have a tragedy. So I knew I had an advantage over them. But nonetheless, they couldn't see it coming. Time and time and time again. And that was one of the questions that I wanted to answer. Why does that happen? How does it happen? How can we prevent that from happening? And by that research in neuroscience, I got introduced to situational awareness. It's kind of an odd thing that I get a chance to stand here and talk with you about a topic that only 10 years ago, I knew almost nothing about. And you think about how weird that is that I had spent 25 years in my career as a firefighter and a company officer and a chief, and I knew so little about situational awareness. 
And as I started to learn some things about situational awareness and high risk decision making, my eyes started to open up and I started to see and learn things that I had never been taught any time in my whole career. And then I wondered, how did I miss this? I've taken a lot of classes. How did I miss the class where they taught about this and this and this and this? And then I realized I didn't miss any classes. That stuff's not being taught to any of us in the fire service. How could that be? How did we miss, how did we as a fire service did we miss such critical lessons on situational awareness and high risk decision making? Now the issues of situational awareness are a really, really big deal. If you look at the line of duty death reports, you will see strong connections to the things that we're going to talk about today. Strong connections to barriers that flaw situational awareness. And as situational awareness gets impacted, then so goes decision making. Because situational awareness is the foundation for good decision making. So as people have their situational awareness impacted, it usually ends up in some bad decision making. The problem is they don't realize that their situational awareness is being impacted as it's happening. It's usually only after the fact that they come to that realization of, wow, I really lost my situational awareness in this circumstance or that. But at the moment that it was happening, they didn't even realize it. So what I'm going to share with you today is some neuroscience, but I'm going to do it in a very, very friendly way. I'm not going to try to impress you with any big terminology from neuroscience because these lessons are so important that I don't want you confused and I don't want to be talking over your head. I want to make sure that you get these lessons so that when you get on the street, these lessons make perfect sense for you and you will be able to see and experience the very things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. I'm going to overlay to, those, to, that, to, that, um, to the science my 30 years of experience. Now, there's really nothing stellar about my 30 years in the fire service. I didn't work for any big cities, and you know, I saw a lot of fires over the, in other types of emergencies over the course of my 30 years, but it's just been what I would call you know, an average person's career. I don't have any, any really special knowledge there, but I, I do want you to understand that I understand the, the, the fire and EMS business. And then I'm gonna overlay more than 500 line of duty death reports that I have evaluated, all from the perspective of situational awareness and high risk decision making. And that's really where the lessons start to pop. Because when you take the line of duty deaths and you overlay it to the neuroscience, it was, li it was, like, it was like this light bulb came on over my head. And everything that before was confusing to me of how these things could happen made clear and perfect sense. And that's what I'm hoping to accomplish today. If I say anything that is confusing or you're not really sure that you got it, raise your hand and hold me accountable and make sure that I explain it in a way that you get it completely. Because I want to know that when you go onto the street, you totally understand the things that I'm sharing. So hold me accountable if, if, we, if, we, need to, uh, if we need to do that. So, in addition to the line of duty death reports, which I encourage you to become a student of, that re those reports really taught me things, so many valuable things throughout my whole career. And in fact, early on in my career, a, a, a chief recommended to me, he said, if you want to make sure that you're doing your best not to get anyone killed, then study the line of duty death reports. You realize that every firefighter that has died in the line of duty has taught us something. And the lessons that they taught us are contained in those reports. When you go to those reports, you're going to see strong tie-ins to issues related to situational awareness. It's, it's a really, really big deal. The second place you can go to get your proof of how big of a deal this is, is there's a website called the Firefighter Near Miss Reporting System. It's a place where firefighters can go and report their own near miss events and, and give all the details and, and what happened and how it happened and the lessons that they learned. That's another valuable resource for us. Now, the near miss reports, you actually get to hear right from the mouths of the people who almost died. So they get to tell their story of, wow, I, I didn't see this coming. I made this mistake. I wish I would have done this differently. Uh, and, and that's very powerful. 
when you go to the near miss report uh, website, they summarize the near misses for uh, e every year. So when somebody reports a near miss, there is a list of 20 different contributing factors that a person can identify is what caused their near miss. And they're, they're able to pick five, up to five of those contributing factors. So what you see up here on, on the board is the summary of near misses for just one year's data. And you'll notice that there is one bar that rises above all the other bars on the contributing factors for near misses. And that is situational awareness. This particular year, it was the number one contributing factor to near miss events. And it's been number one every single year. Every year it's number one. It's a really big deal. The problem is, most of us have not been taught anything about it. Think about how, that might be funny if it wasn't so tragic, that the number one contributing factor to our near misses and casualties, most of us get little to no training on. That needs to change. It's gonna change for you today. What we have in the fire service is a knowledge gap. Up here is what we need to know about situational awareness. Down here is what most of us have ever been taught about it. And that is a knowledge gap. And that's, that's what we need to close so that we have a better understanding of these things that are, are leading contributing factors to our injuries and fatalities. So to start it off, we have to come up with a definition for situational awareness. What is it? As I uh, as I have the opportunity to talk with many audiences, one of the things that I will do is I will get the most experienced person in the room um, and I will ask them a question. And uh, for this gentleman in the back here who's retired after how many years did you work, sir? Now that you're, you're doing it kind of part-time, right? All right, so how many years in, in the service? Fire service? Yeah. 35. 35 years in the fire service. Okay. Let's... Volunteer. That's, that's fine. 35 years in the fire service. Now, when you got in 35 years ago and you got some training about how to be a firefighter, did they teach you about situational awareness? No. no. And that's, that's the consistent answer that I get. No, they didn't. But there's a good explanation for that because 35 years ago, those words, situational awareness, had not really come together yet for the benefit of first responder community. We didn't know anything about it then. So we didn't, we didn't learn anything about situation awareness. Nobody knew anything to even teach us about it. When I was new, same thing. I wasn't taught anything about situation awareness. I was told things like, pay attention and don't get tunnel vision. And that was pretty much it. That was, the, that was about the, the extent of the lessons. As I get a chance to talk to new firefighters, I often ask new firefighters, hey, did you learn anything about situation awareness in your basic training program? Most of them say no. Some of them say yes, because in some departments, like Madison, they have embraced the value of the lesson of situational awareness. And I know from talking with my son, who went through the academy a year and a half ago, he said, he said situational awareness is included in just about every lesson we get when we're going through the academy, which is awesome. I can't even tell you how good that makes me feel. And I know that Chief Langer has a lot to, lot to do with that because he's attended some of my programs. And as he says, he says, Doc, I've drank your Kool-Aid. I believe in the message. But a lot of places still teach nothing about situational awareness. And that really is tragic. All right, so what I'm gonna start out with is the definition that we're gonna use and work throughout, with, throughout the whole day. What is this thing that we know as situational awareness? Situational awareness is the ability to perceive and understand what is happening in the environment around you. In context as to how time is passing, because as time passes, conditions change. And as conditions change, so will then our awareness of those changing conditions. And then, in turn, be able to predict the future, hopefully in time to avoid a bad outcome. 
So that's the definition. The ability to perceive and understand what is happening in the environment around you in the context of changing time and being able to pre make an accurate prediction of the future and time to prevent a bad outcome. Now, as you're preparing for, responding to, arriving at, sizing up, and operating at incident scenes, I would hope that you would keep that definition in mind. There's just one problem. It's too big. There's too much there. You and you, when you're, when you're working an incident, there's a lot of things going through your mind and a lot of things that need to be done and a lot of information needs to be analyzed. And you're certainly gonna, not going to be keeping that big definition circling around, although I think it would help you. So what I've done is I've got it down to three words. Perceive, understand, and predict. And if you can just keep those three words circling around as you're preparing for responding to arriving at, sizing up, and operating in an incident scene, you'll be far more likely to develop and maintain strong situational awareness. Perceive, understand, and predict. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those three words and I'm going to break them down, kind of thin slice the definition, and explain to you what each of those three words mean and how it is that you do each of those three things. So to, to do this, I like to use a metaphor of building a house. When you build a house, you have to have a strong foundation on which the house is going to sit. And then on that strong foundation, you build walls, and on those walls, you put a roof. And that's how we're gonna build situational awareness. We're gonna start with a foundation, and then walls, and then a roof. The foundation has to be strong. If not for a strong foundation, the walls and the roof cannot be supported. And the foundation for situational awareness, where it all begins, is perception. Perception is the start. We would call level one situational awareness. Perception is the process by which you use your senses to gather information about what is happening around you. Seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. If I were to talk with somebody who, if I asked them, do you have good situational awareness? And they'd say, yes, I think I do. And I'd say, how do you know? And that person might say, because I pay attention. Or they might say, I keep my head on a swivel. Or they might say, I'm always looking up, down, and all around as I'm operating in an incident scene. Or they might say, I actively listen to the things that are going on around me, and I actively listen to my radio. Or they might say, I conduct a good, thorough size up when I arrive. If you talk with anyone who describes their situational awareness using any of those terms, they're not wrong but they're only describing the beginning. They're only describing the foundation. There are two more component parts after the paying attention. In fact, I'm gonna make a very strong argument and I'm gonna do some examples in the, in, the, in the form of exercises today that will demonstrate for you just how hard it is to pay attention. When you think you're paying attention and you think you're all in and you think you know what's going on, we're going to show you how hard that can be. And we're going to do that in a classroom where it's calm and quiet and no stress, no lights, no siren, no smoke, no one screaming. Nice and quiet and peaceful here. And we'll demonstrate for you how challenging it is to pay attention and to listen. You have five senses. They're always on, always gathering information, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. All five of the senses that gather the information, all five of the inputs are on the outside of your brain. Your eyes are on the outside of the brain, ears on the outside, nose, mouth, skin, all of them on the outside of the brain. Well, somehow that information that they gather has to get inside your brain. How does that happen? I'm going to use seeing and hearing as the two predominant examples as I tell you how it is that things get from perception into the brain. There are three other senses, hearing, hear, or I'm sorry, feeling, tasting, and smelling. But hopefully in the first responder world, we're not out smelling and tasting a whole lot of things to try to figure out what's happening with a problem. It can happen, believe me, especially even on some, you know, some medical calls, and I'll spare you the details if you don't know that already. 
But uh, so let's talk about seeing and hearing. First of all, to be able to see anything, there has to be light, a source of light. In the absence of all light and total darkness, there is no vision. So in this room, the light is coming from the light fixtures. So the light comes out of the light fixtures, it bounces off of you and comes into my eyes. There are nerves inside of my eyes that accept those rays of light or photons of light and take those rays of light and turn them into electricity and then send the electricity back into my brain. Not one bit of light you see ever gets inside of your brain. It's a very dark place. The only thing that gets inside the brain is electrical impulses, like Morse code. That's all. When you listen to anything, sounds or people talking, sound waves come into your ears, the nerves inside of your ears take the sound waves and turn them into electricity and send the electricity back into your brain. Not one bit of sound that you hear ever actually gets inside of your brain. Now, if you're in a place where it's very loud, you can feel vibration, you know, like loud music and maybe an explosion. But sound doesn't get inside your brain. It's a very, very quiet place. The only thing that gets in there is electricity, Morse code. So the only thing happening inside of there is all this electrical activity, you know, shooting down highways, trying to reach a destination to help you understand anything that's going on in, in the world around you. That information travels down five different highways, one for each of the senses. A highway for seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. All five of your senses operate independently of each other, but yet at the same time, they operate very dependent on each other. In other words, what you see influences what you hear, what you see influences taste, what you smell influences what you taste, and so on. All the senses are integrated, interconnected. In fact, in the absence of one sense, it can very, be very hard for another sense to work. Let me give you an example of this. One of my children's favorite sixth grade science fair project is called the blind taste test, where you take people and you blindfold them, and then you have them taste things and say, what is it? And you would be surprised how difficult it is for a person to understand taste without first seeing what they're going to taste. In other words, seeing it first kind of sets the expectation that it's going to taste like peanut butter because I can see it's peanut butter. But if you take peanut butter and you thin it out so that it's not pasty and blindfold somebody and have them taste it, they may not even be able to tell you that what they just tasted is peanut butter because the eyes set the expectation for what the mouth will taste. So all of the senses are tied together or integrated. When those five highways of information come together and the puzzle pieces of information from seeing get added to hearing, feel, taste, and smell, and the puzzle all gets assembled, then we advance to the second level of situational awareness, the walls of the house, so to speak, understanding. Understanding is the process by which your brain takes what you see and adds it to what you hear and feel and taste and smell. Basically, assembling the puzzle. Sometimes it's called comprehension. Sometimes it's called having a moment of clarity. Maybe you've been in a situation where something seemed confusing, and all of a sudden in come one additional piece of information from one of the senses, and that missing puzzle piece popped right into place, and you went, ah, now I understand. Just a moment ago, I didn't understand, but now I understand completely because of that missing information gave you that moment of clarity. When you're trying to understand what's going on in the world around you, you might ask yourself a couple of questions. One, what does this mean? Because in your mind you've got this picture, this puzzle that's been put together, asking yourself, what truly does this mean? And does it mean what I expected it to mean? Because as you're preparing for and responding to and arriving at emergency scenes, you have expectations about what you're going to see at that emergency scene based on your past experiences and based on your training. So when you're looking at the current situation, it's always a best practice in developing situational awareness to say, did I expect to see this? Or is this something 
novel or completely unexpected to me. Because the, the expectations then set up a whole bunch of other things to happen. For example, if you expect to see something and you want to see it bad enough, you will see it, even if it does not exist. Your brain will hallucinate the presence of something that isn't there if you have an expectation that you're going to see it. If you want to hear something bad enough, even though it was never said, your brain will hear it as if it were said because you wanted to hear it bad enough. It makes it up and you hear it. And it can also do the opposite. If you don't expect to see something and it is there, you may not see it at all. That's called reverse hallucination, where you don't even see what's going on right in front of you. And the same thing can happen with hearing, and the same thing can happen with all the senses. So one of the things that we have to get over quickly is the realization that the things that we experience in life are only a partial representation of reality, because it, all the time the brain is actively assessing what it thinks you should be seeing and hearing and planting those audible messages and visual images on your brain. Constantly the brain does this, making up its own reality, almost independent of what really is happening. That can cause us some problems on emergency scenes, as you could imagine. It seems so easy. All we have to do is just see something, turn it into electricity, send it down the highway, and let the brain understand it. All we have to do is hear something, turn it into electricity, send it down the road, and let the brain understand it. But it's really not that easy at all. It's a very, very complex process, and a lot of things can go wrong. You can even go as far as to say to someone, I understand what you're saying to me. But you may not understand at all what they're saying to you, even though you say you understand. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep. See, it just happened. <laughs> right? How do I know? I said, do you understand? He said, yes, I do. But does he really? I won't do this to you, but the only way I could really know is to ask him, repeat back what I said. And if he repeated it back, and if he got it right, then I could say, you truly understand. And in fact, I'd even, I even could go further to say that if what I intended to say, you truly understood, you and I now have what is called shared situational awareness. In other words, your understanding and my understanding are agreeing with each other. If I said, repeat back what I said, and he got it wrong, it doesn't mean it's his fault. I could have said the wrong thing. I could have explained it the wrong way. I could have had a slip of the tongue. He could have said, you said this, and I could say, I didn't say that. And you'd say, yes, you did. And I said, no, I didn't. I'm sure I didn't say that. And the rest of the class would say, oh, yes, you did say that. Really? I said that? I didn't mean to say that. Well, that's what you said. Because you can say the wrong thing and not even realize that you're miscommunicating. So it's a very easy to have these um, errors in, in understanding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you now to the first barrier to awareness. The first thing, well, the, there will be many that we'll talk about today, but one of the ways that your situational awareness can get messed up and you may not even realize that it's happening, and it happens in the process of trying to understand what is happening between perception and understanding, because a lot of things can cause this derailment. So the first one I want to talk about is sensory conflict. What does that mean? Sensory conflict means the inputs coming in to your brain from two or more of the senses don't agree with each other. For example, you're at an incident scene. What your eyes see tells you what is going on is A. But at the very same time, your ears hear something that says, no, what is going on is B. Now we have a conflict. Because the eyes see A and the ears hear B. So simply think of it this way. That information coming in as, think of them as puzzle pieces, when it gets inside the brain and the brain tries to put the puzzle together, those pieces are not going to fit. 
because there are two um, pieces of information that don't agree with each other. Now we have sensory conflict. Then what happens? Well, it, the brain, for, first off, the brain does not like confusion. So as those pieces of information come into the brain and it's trying to fit the puzzle together to form the understanding and the puzzle pieces don't fit and the brain gets confused, it sends a whole lot of resources to the scene of that situation trying to figure out how do we get these pieces to fit together? How am I confused? Is what I saw right? Is what I heard right? Did I miss here? Did I miss see? And, uh, and so your brain is is focused on trying to resolve this conflict. Now you don't necessarily even know at the conscious level that your brain is, is doing this. But when it is trying to resolve the conflict and all those resources are paying attention to the conflict and trying to fix it, you can suffer from a situation that I call mind drift. Your mind drifts out of consciousness. Your mind drifts out of awareness of where you're at and what you're doing. In other words, you're at an emergency scene and your mind is somewhere else. You're conscious, alert, oriented. Your eyes are open. You're still listening. You're still seeing things. You're still hearing things. But the brain is no longer processing the meaning of any of those clues going on around you. Maybe you've, been, you've experienced this. You've been in a conversation with somebody and something else is on your mind while you're having that conversation. And while you're acknowledging them, you're not really listening to them. And then you have to say, what did you, wait a minute, wait, what, did you, what did you just say? Because I wasn't thinking about what you were saying. I was actually thinking about something else at the moment. And you might think that your mind would not drift when you're working at emergency scenes, that you would be all in on the task. And that's really more a wish of how the brain works than how it actually does. Um, all of us experience mind drift every day. You're going to experience mind drift here today during the class. You won't know it. I won't know it. Well, you could, you might know it because if your mind drifts out of conscious awareness of being here in the room, then you'll go from hearing me speaking to hearing wah, 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 which is your warning sign that your mind is somewhere else, sound is still coming into your ears, but all of a sudden that sound doesn't mean anything to you now because your mind has drifted into another dimension of understanding. And you might be thinking, well, I'm working at a high risk, high consequence emergency scene. I'm going to be all in on what I'm doing, all in on paying attention to the things that I'm doing, all in listening to my radio, and my mind isn't going to drift when I'm doing a high risk activity. Yes, it will. Or I should say, yes, it can. I can't promise you that it will, but it can. Many of us, if not all of us, have experienced mind drift, maybe even just today already. Raise your hand. If you have ever driven your vehicle somewhere, arrived at the destination, and then wondered to yourself, how did I get here? All right? All right, hands down. That's mind drift. And think about it. That's mind drifting while you're performing a high risk, high consequence activity. You're driving your car at highway speeds and not paying attention to driving. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, you were texting or talking on your phone. Your eyes were on the road. Your ears were, were still operating and listening. Maybe the radio was on. Maybe what caused you to drift was a song on the radio. And all of a sudden, you're thinking about, what am I going to do for the weekend? Do I, oh, I got to buy these Christmas presents? Or, you know, your mind drifts off task, and you're still driving your vehicle at highway speeds. That's a very dangerous place for your mind to be. Think about it. It isn't just your mind drifting. You're driving your vehicle among other people whose minds have drifted off the act of driving too. And you have to watch out for them. Now, how can you drift out of consciousness and still drive your vehicle and not get in an accident? Because what happens, thankfully for us, is as our conscious mind drifts off task, our, con our subconscious mind steps in and starts doing the task for us, starts driving the vehicle for us, starts doing that activity on the fire ground for us. Now to be able to do that, we have to have training, 
and we have to have experience. Because the training and experience has to be stored in the subconscious for it to, to go into this automatic mode. That's why young drivers are far more likely to get into accidents. As experienced drivers, and our, as our mind drifts, the subconscious just picks up, starts driving the vehicle for us, all good. But a young driver who does not have a collection of experience of driving is not able to shift into subconscious mode because there's not enough stored experiences there to drive the car for them. So when a young person's conscious mind drifts off task, they're far more likely to get in an accident because the subconscious doesn't know yet how to step in and start doing the driving for them. And, and this level of expertise you will see in, in all fields of life. You've probably seen a professional athlete who, when, when they're on the, on the field or on the court, or on, uh, it seems like they're just in automatic mode. It seems like what they do is so effortless that it's almost like they don't even have to think about what they're doing. I think of, I think of you know, one of my uh, um, you know, favorite examples, um, a little dated now, but Michael Jordan. When Michael Jordan was on the basketball court, it was just like, it was like, it happened so automatically. He's, it's like he's not even thinking about what he's doing. It just happens. And as you talk to professional athletes, a lot of them say, what do you, you say, what were you, you thinking when you, they, they don't think about the game, their mind is somewhere else. They try to keep their conscious mind out of the way of their subconscious programming and let their training kick in and do it automatically. So mind drift in that respect is not always a bad thing, but when your mind drifts out of task, you're no longer paying attention to the things that are happening around you. So let me give you an example how you can experience mind drift. So it, it'll, it'll, I'll give it to you in the form of a homework example. I don't know if anyone's ever really done this homework example, uh, but it's, it's just kind of a, a, a metaphor to give you an idea of how you could experience it. Go to the mall, and in the mall there is a store called Bath and Body Works. I want you to go to Bath and Body Works. That's your homework assignment. Bath and Body Works, they make the most amazing foaming hand soaps in the world. I'm telling you. Now, I don't, I'm not, it's not a paid endorsement. Their foaming hand soaps are amazing. Now, I know some of you, you're throwing judgment at me. Oh, he's a, he's a, he's a foaming hand soap guy. <laughs> Look, they're, they're amazing how they smell. And what I want you to do is I want you to go there and try one out. And the one that I want you to try out is called Peach Bellini. It's amazing. I don't know how they do it. It is incredible. You, you, so what I want you to do, they got a sink there, they'll let you try anything out. Say, I want to try this Peach Bellini hand soap. Go over, get the foaming stuff, that's the best. <laughs> Go over to the, to the sink, close your eyes. With your eyes closed, what I want you to do is spray the, the hand soap on your hands, rub them together, and smell it. I'm going to tell you now, it is going to smell just like a fresh cut bowl of peaches. I don't know how they've done it. They've got it perfect. And then, I want you to taste it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's it going to taste like? Oh, oh, you know, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, poor Ralphie. <laughs> this is sensory conflict. The nose smelled peaches, which sets up an expectation that when you taste it, the taste should agree with the smell. That's pretty standard human expectation. But it doesn't. And when it doesn't, that sets the alarm bells off. When it doesn't, the inputs coming in are not in agreement. The puzzle pieces are not going to fit together, and you are going to experience a mind drift. Now, obviously, if you're there with that intention to do that experiment, it wouldn't exactly happen that way. But imagine if you tasted something that was not consistent with what you smelled and how that could set some alarm bells off inside of your head saying, what just went wrong? That's what can happen excuse me, when you're experiencing mind drift. Now, where in, the ma where in the brain does the five highways of information come together? There has to be some place where what you see and what you hear and feel, taste and smell, that all those puzzle pieces get assembled to give you one coherent understanding of the world. And there is a place where that happens. It is the neural location of consciousness. It's the place in the brain where you become consciously aware of the things that are happening around you. If that part of the brain were ever damaged, 
in an accident or illness, you might live in a permanent comatose state, never again able to be conscious. It is also the location where you form your situational awareness. It's the place where the puzzle pieces get put together. And here, I'm going to show it to you, is where it, where it happens. On your magical Etch-a-Sketch. Yeah. Every one of us has an Etch-a-Sketch inside of our brain. Now, before I get too deep into talking about the Etch-a-Sketch, I have to ask, does everybody in the room know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? Yeah? I'll tell you why. I was in uh, another state, and I was doing a program. For, they had had me come out to do a program for young wildland firefighting hand crews, college students working summer jobs as wildland firefighting hand crews. And I had about uh, 150 of these young men and women in this program, and I was about 20 minutes deep into my discussion of the Etch-a-Sketch in the Brain when this young man at the, sitting on the end of one of the rows raises his hand, and I said, yes, what is it? He said, what's an Etch-a-Sketch? And I'm like, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to actually stop and explain to him what an Etch-a-Sketch is and how it works, and you got the two knobs, and as you turn them, you know, it's kind of got a little thing that kind of draws the picture on the screen, and he says, oh, he says, I get it. He said, it's like a, like a paint program for old people. That's what he says to me. <laughs> and there's 150 of them, so I can't even like you know defend myself because they're all you know they're all like oh, like yeah okay. Think of it as a paint program for old people. Every one of us has in our brain an etch a sketch or a paint program, and the etch a sketch inside of the brain truly is a magic screen. When I explain to you what happens here and how it happens here, I. I I don't know if you'll be as amazed as I was, but I was absolutely astounded how the brain processes the meaning of anything that we experience in life. Everything you see, hear, feel, taste, and smell travels down five different highways and lands on your Etch-a-Sketch, where the puzzle gets put together. Now, here's the, here's the really interesting thing. Everything that you see, once it gets then turned to electricity, comes down to, and gets reassembled here as a picture. Well, that makes sense. What I see gets turned into a picture. But everything you hear also gets turned into a picture. Imagine that. Everything that you hear gets turned into a picture on your Etch-a-Sketch. Everything you smell gets turned into a picture. Everything you taste gets turned into a picture. When you smell a peach, for you to understand that that smell is a peach, your brain has to go into memory, pluck a peach, and put it onto the Etch-a-Sketch to tell you this smell matches this picture. Everything you see, hear, feel, taste, and smell gets assembled as a picture of understanding. Now, um, we have um, company officer, comp so somebody, somebody that uh, rides, rides an engine or a ladder as a company officer. You, is that you, sir? Yeah, okay. So what's your first name? Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, I got a question for you. As you're going to a call and dispatch tells you what you're going to, you know, giving you information about the call, do you see a picture of the scene that you're going to in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Think about that. The words from the dispatcher coming over the radio paints a picture of understanding in the mind of the responder. Now, some dispatchers are far more talented at painting pictures than others. Some of them are like Picassos, they're so good. They know what words to say, what words not to say, exactly how to paint this beautiful picture of understanding in our mind. Some dispatchers, are not as good as others. Maybe they lack experience. Maybe they've never been on a fire scene before. You imagine a dispatcher who's never actually been out in the world of firefighting and been on a fire scene. Where would their understanding of how, what a fire scene looks like, where would it come from? Television and movies. Backdraft, Ladder 49, Rescue Me, If You're Old Enough, Towering Inferno. 
that would be their understanding of how fire scenes operate. And for anybody who's lived in the real world, you know the real world of emergency scenes is really not the same as what we see in TV and movies. So some of the best dispatchers are, are dispatchers who's also served as firefighters or do ride-alongs with the fire department so they get to see the real world of what happens and then their words become our understanding. Now the dispatchers also have situational awareness. Where does the situational awareness for a dispatcher come from? The 911 caller. And we have no control over the quality of the information that comes into us from 911. Sometimes callers talk very fast, sometimes callers are not telling the truth, sometimes they realize they're not telling the truth, sometimes they don't. Multiple callers reporting multiple things, sometimes that information agrees with each other, sometimes it doesn't. And the dispatcher has to gather all this information in about 90 seconds, put their puzzle of understanding together based on the caller's information, and send you down the road with what they think is an accurate representation of what you're going to, which is painted as a picture on our mind. Everything that we see here, feel, taste, and smell gets turned into understanding as a visual image. Just think of it as the, as the brain taking various puzzle pieces and assembling them into a picture, a, truly a picture of understanding. Now, there are some puzzle pieces you cannot see and you cannot hear. Why? Because you're not paying attention? No, because they don't exist. I'm actually going to talk to you about non-existent information. Things that you can't see and you can't hear at a fire scene because they're not there. Well, if they're not there, then what in the world would they have to do with situational awareness? Everything. Those that missing information is called negative clues and cues. There's two kinds of information that we will gather at an emergency scene. Positive clues and cues and negative clues and cues. Now positive and negative don't mean good and bad. Positive and negative mean present and absent. There is actually missing information that can be very valuable to our understanding about what is happening. That's the negative information. Take, for example, a, um, somebody with expert knowledge, chief level officer, at an emergency scene. Take a novice, brand new, right out of the academy, put them right beside the experts. So you got the experienced and the new. Stand side by side, and you ask the new person, what's going on here? And the new person say, well, I think this is going on. Well, how do you know? Well, because I see that, and I see that, and I see that, and over the radio I heard that, and I heard that, and I heard that. So when I put that together, that's my understanding. All right. Then you turn to the expert and you ask the expert, what do you think's going on? And the expert has a completely different explanation than the novice. Completely different. Sometimes causing the novice to turn to the expert and say, how did you come up with that? And the expert might say, well, I saw that and that and that that you saw. And I heard that and that and that that you heard. But I didn't see this and I should have. And I didn't see this, but I should have. And I didn't hear this, but I should have. You see, the experts can make sense out of what is not there. The information that should be there, based on their expectations, actually becomes a puzzle piece in their puzzle. Novices are not able to do that because they don't know what information is missing. That's why novices sometimes look at the experts like they're Yodas, like, how can you be so wise? Well, after years and years and years of training and experience, you not only know what you should be seeing, but you know what you shouldn't be seeing, and you know what is missing that should be there. And with experience comes that knowledge. Only experts are able to make sense out of the missing information. Novices are just, they're not able to do this. In time, with experience, with experience novices will be able to do this. So, then what happens? The picture on the Etch-a-Sketch is then snapshotted and sent up into memory. And when it is sent up into the long-term memory search, something amazing happens. What happens next? The picture, puzzle pieces, fit together, makes one photograph. That photograph is then snapshotted and sent up into memory. When it is sent up, up in the memory, it does a search of your long-term memory bank. Now this 
is a big file search. The average person's long-term memory capacity is estimated to be about 10 times all the information that is stored on the internet. Let that sink in for a moment. 10 times everything on the internet is the capacity of your long-term memory. Access, that's a whole other issue. The average person, that's us, average people, can only access about 5% of their long-term memory store. Think about that. 95% of everything you have ever learned in life is completely outside of your awareness. You don't even know that you ever had that experience or that you ever learned it. You have 5% you got ready recall, 95% no recall at all. When the brain is doing the file search, well, first of all, let me, let me give you an example of the difference between the 95% and the 5%. Um, so I need, I need somebody that's kind of been, been around for a while. Sir, what is your name? Dave. 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 Um, Dave, do you remember where you were and what you were doing on September 11th, 2001? Yeah, see, some of these folks, I'm like, uh, the, too, too young to rate, you know? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so where, where were you, sir, and what were you doing? I uh, just got off shift. I was in my vehicle at the intersection of Highway 53 and County M, and heard it on the radio. Wow, right down to County 53 and Highway M, heard it on the radio, and then I assume you might have then continued to listen to it on the radio, and then where, where were you headed? Were you headed, headed home? And then when you got home, what'd you do? Turn it on the TV, watch it on the TV. Now, while you were listening to it on the radio, not, not knowing your commute time, had the second plane hit yet? No. So when you got home, you saw that play out live on, on the radio. Okay. Uh, on the, I'm sorry, on the television, yeah. All right, so Dave has a pretty good recall of September 11th, 2001. Dave, if you would please tell me where you were and what you were doing on August 11th, 2001, just 30 days earlier. Not a clue. Now, are we somehow led to believe that September 11th went into Dave's memory bank, but August 11th was just erased away? Nope. August 11th is in there too, but it's outside of his awareness. See, the September 11th is part of his 5% memory, and the August 11th is part of the 95% memory. Now what causes September 11th to stick in his 5% memory and August 11th doesn't? Two things predominantly. Repetition. As you know, the events of September 11th played over and over and over again on television for not only days, but weeks, months, years, and now decades. Repetition and emotions. The more an emotional event is, the more likely that event is to take up a permanent place in our 5% memory. So what we probably know about August 11th is it was not a particularly emotional day for Dave, and it wasn't the day that he lived over and over again in repetition like a Groundhog Day, and he has no memory of it. But it's in there. And when the brain does this long-term memory search, it's searching both both the 5% and the 95%. If it, it's, what it's doing is it's looking for solutions to problems. It's looking for your past training and past experiences that matches the current situation that might guide then your decisions and your actions. And if it finds a match that is part of the 95% of, the of memory that resides outside of your awareness, if it finds the match there, it can trigger the sixth sense. Now the sixth sense is the only sense that resides inside the brain and sends its information outward. Remember from earlier that all the other senses are all on the outside of the brain and send their information inward. The sixth sense work almost in opposite fashion of the other five senses. Now what is the name that we give to the sixth sense that resides inside the brain and sends its information outward. What is the name of that sixth sense? 
Anybody know? ESP. Well, it's sometimes called that. I'm looking for a different term. Uh, that's how you know it, but there's a term for it. Spidey senses. Spidey senses. <laughs> yeah, if you watch the movies, that's, that's where it is. But it has a, ter has a name. Intuition. Yes, sir. Who said it? Intuition. What's your name? Matt. Matt. Matt, I was so sure that you were going to say intuition that I programmed it onto the screen. Intuition. What is intuition? The definition for intuition is strange. Intuition means knowing without knowing how you know. Knowing something without knowing how you know it because your knowledge of it is at the subconscious level. It's at that 95% knowledge level that's outside of your awareness. You know something because you learned it on August 11th, 2001. But you don't know how you know it. You don't even remember that day. You don't remember that hazmat class you took, but, all, but you know what to do almost automatically. Intuition is your brain's most powerful red flag warning system designed to alert you to danger. Because it contains all of your life's experiences. Imagine how many things you've learned in life that could actually help you, if not save you. If only you could remember all of those lessons. Everything that you learned in your training. Every call that you've been on. Well, all of that information's in there, cataloged, stored, ready to help you. If only we would trust our intuition. Now this is a part of the program where I feel a little bit like a hypocrite because I'm going to try to make a very strong and compelling argument for why you should trust your intuition, but yet at the same time make a confession to you that I haven't always done that, especially when I was working as a first responder. I didn't always trust my gut. I didn't always trust my intuition. I didn't always believe the internal warnings, and, and, and many times it came back to bite me. A lot of first responders are really challenged with trusting a feeling over having facts of information right in front of them. There are some problems with intuition that we least need to acknowledge. The first is it's so easy to distrust our intuition. And the reason we distrust it is we really don't understand where it comes from. Like, for example, a gentleman back here said, gut feeling. Gut feeling is the single most commonly identified outward manifestation of intuition. When you get the gut feeling, that's your brain trying to warn you, trying to alert you to something. A lot of people think the intuition, the gut feeling, is psychological. It's not psychological. It's biological. And there's a big difference between psychology and biology. There's a little emotional control center inside of your brain. And when the brain is doing that file search and it finds a match, that's exciting. And that emotional control center inside the brain, when it gets that match and it wants to alert you to something, it will send a message down nerves that end in the abdomen. When you get that knotted up, squeezed up, gut feeling, that's not psychological. That's your brain sending you the warning sign. Now, it may not be just come to you in the form of a gut feeling. Sometimes the hair might stand up on the back of your neck. Sometimes you might get an impending feeling of doom. Uh, different from fear, doom, you know, doom is that, that all of a sudden ominous feeling that your life may be coming to an end. Um, you may have voices inside of your head talking to you, trying to alert you, trying to warn you of the... I'm not talking about those voices that always are in your head talking to you. There are, there are, there's other voices trying to alert you, trying to talk you into or out of doing something. Now, the sad part is most first responders, when they benefit from intuition, they dismiss it and they go right past it. Now, how would I know, how would I know this? Well, one, I know it from my own experience, but two, uh, I'm going to turn you on to a resource that you might find valuable to you. I have a 
podcast radio show. On, you can get it on iTunes or Stitcher for your, on your mobile device, or you, or you can just listen to it right on the, the desktop of, of the homepage of my website. I interview people who've had near misses. I interview firefighters who've almost got killed. And I give them a platform to tell their stories of what happened, how it happened, what they learned from it. And you'd be surprised how many of them, in the course of telling their stories, and these are some amazing stories, some of these firefighters were with other firefighters who died, and these are the ones who survived. Flashovers, collapses, hit on the roadway, shot. Um, oh, just story after story. How many of them say to me, my intuition told me, my gut feeling told me, the voices inside of the head were telling me, and I ignored it. You need to hear them say this. You need to hear them basically make the admission to you, I should have trusted my gut, and I didn't. It's hard to justify decisions based on feelings instead of facts and data. You know, if you need to make a decision, like you're going to buy a car, and I say, here's all the consumer report information on a car, safety rating, mileage, you know, um, how well people like it. All those facts and data can help you choose the car that you think is best for your need. It's data. But when you make decisions based just on feeling, it's a little harder to justify, especially on a fire ground. Imagine a fire ground on a fire ground when some, an incident commander makes a decision to pull everybody out of the building. And the crews come out, of course some of them aren't going to be real happy that they were pulled out of the building. Because we're firefighters and we tend to be on the, a little bit on the aggressive side. And somebody comes out and they go up to the incident commander and say, why did you order us out? And imagine the reaction if the commander said, I don't know, I just kind of had a feeling. A feeling? You pulled us out because you have a feeling? Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Set your feelings aside, we got work to do here. It's really hard to make decisions based on feelings because when somebody calls us on it and says, why did you do that? Or why didn't you do that? To be able to say, well, here's the evidence, here's the proof, here's the facts, here's the data. It's much easier than to say a feeling. In fact, let me, uh, let me share with you uh, a story right from a, from a class that I did. I was in, in uh, Carmel, Indiana, and I was doing a situation awareness class with about 100 and 50 people in the room, and I was talking about intuition, and the chief of the Carmel Fire Department stood up out of his chair and come right to the front of the room and said, can I talk to the class for a moment? I had no idea he was going to do it. I said, sure, chief, go ahead. And he, said, he says, first thing he says is, it wasn't my intention to get up and say anything to you folks today. He says, but when he said this, he said, I feel like I need to tell you something. And he shared a story that was so compelling that with his permission, I've shared it with every class since. Here's what he said. Many of you know I'm the chief of the Carmel Fire Department. Before Carmel, I was the chief of the Indianapolis Fire Department. And in 1992, I was the incident commander at a structure fire that we had in a hotel in downtown Indianapolis called the Athletic Club Hotel. He says, I want to tell you what happened that night. He said, I didn't plan on telling this story but it, it ties to this lesson of intuition. He said the, the call came in just a little bit after midnight, and he said, I'm uh, at the scene. I've got, I've, no, let me tell you a little bit about the Athletic Club Hotel. Uh, somewhere around a 10 to 12 story, turn of the century, really old hotel in downtown Indianapolis, no sprinkler systems, still being used as a hotel, and the fire is on the third floor in the ballroom. All right, so they got the companies there. They're on the fire attack. Everything's, everything's you know, working out to a plan. And all of a sudden, Chief Smith gets a gut feeling that something is about to go wrong. And he says to himself, I need to pull everybody out. I need to pull everybody out and go defensive. And be just before he makes that call, his safety officer walks up to him and says, so, chief, how do you think things are going here? And he says to the safety officer, I don't think things are going well. I think we should pull everybody out and go defensive. And the safety officer says, really? 
why do you say that? And Chief Smith says, I don't know. I just got this terrible gut feeling that something's going to go wrong. I don't know why I feel this way. I, I can't explain it. I just feel like something's going to happen here. And the safety officer says, oh, Chief, I think everything's going fine. And the chief said, really? He says, how do you know? And the safety officer had this worksheet. And he pulled this worksheet, this clipboard out, and he said, look, chief, we've got an incident commander, we've got a safety officer, we've got operations, we've got attack line, backup crew, vent team, search team, lobby, um, uh, air bottle changing station, da 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 All these beautiful facts and data indicating that they were operating with a strong plan. All this data. And then the safety officer turned back to the chief and said, now why do you think we should go defensive? And the chief said, man, that burrito I ate for dinner, it's just not setting right with me tonight. He dismissed his intuition as indigestion. And within 30 minutes, two firefighters were killed in the Athletic Club Hotel fire. And Chief Smith stood in front of this audience, a man in his mid-60s, with tears rolling down his cheeks, and said, don't you ever let someone talk you out of your intuition. He said, I don't blame my safety officer. He was just doing his job. I blame myself. I knew we were going to kill firefighters. I just didn't know why I knew. I had that gut feeling. I had that connection to something in my past. And I couldn't explain it. And I couldn't justify it. So I completely dismissed it. He said, if you let that happen to you, you'll live every day like I do with the regret that I let that happen. He said, I wake up every morning and say, what did I miss? What did I miss? What was it? He said, 20 years later, I still don't know what it was. It was just something that connected in there and gave me that feeling that if I didn't pull everyone out, we were going to have somebody killed. And two firefighters were killed. Now, I mentioned the podcast, so I'm going to swing back around and I'm going to tell you about one of the podcast episodes. Now, there's over 137 episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, I'm not trying to sell you anything. The podcast is free to listen to. Episode 17, way back near the beginning. I'm teaching a class, and on a break, somebody comes up to me and says, I was in the Athletic Club Hotel fire the night those firefighters got killed. I carried them out. And i like, you want to do a podcast? You want to share the story about what happened? And he agreed to. His name is Doug Abernathy. He, at the time he did the podcast, he was the health and safety chief of the Indianapolis Fire Department. When the fire happened, he was brand new on the job. Been on the job two years. When I, when I did the podcast with him, he shared something with me that was just, it, it just hit me on a very personal level. He said, I wasn't even supposed to be working the night of the fire. He said, I got called in. Somebody had to go home sick or whatever. And they called and said, do you want to come in and work, um, you know, work the rest of the shift? And he said, I went to a station that I never work at. And, I went, and there was a crew there that I never worked with before. He says, and when I went into the station and set, was setting my stuff up, he said, I ran into another firefighter that I went to the academy with. And we're like, oh, he's like, he said it was like a homecoming. It's like, man, how you been? What's going on? You know, and I told him I just got married you know, a year ago and he got married right out of the academy. And he says, we just had this kind of like homecoming, re-get connected thing. It was really cool. And he says, and, you know, we had dinner that night at the station. And he says, and after dinner, he says, this firefighter had told me that his wife had just had a new baby. And he said, and after dinner, she brought the baby by the fire station. And he says, and I got to see him hold his newborn baby. And he said, and I remember thinking to myself, because I didn't have kids yet, how cool that was. And how I couldn't wait to have kids of my own so I could show them the love that, I could, that he was showing for that newborn baby. He says, it'll stick to me forever. And then that night, that firefighter who held that newborn baby died in the athletic club hotel. 
and Doug had to carry him out. Imagine the lessons you can learn from somebody who's experienced that firsthand on the sharp end of those decisions and have to live with those kind of consequences. That's powerful. Swing by, listen to some of those episodes. I think you'll be, one of the recent ones I did was somebody from Wisconsin um, who actually at the time he had his close call was serving as a police officer in Illinois and he was involved in a shootout. And while he was involved in the shootout, he'd realized that he had taken off his ballistic vest when he was eating lunch and didn't put it back on and now he was in a shootout without a vest on. <laughs> Again, swing by, visit it. All right, intuition can be wrong. Whoa, wait a minute, Rich, you just spent all this time telling us these stories about why we should trust our gut and why we should trust our intuition and now you're telling us it could be wrong. Well, if it could be wrong, maybe we shouldn't trust it. <coughs> well, maybe you shouldn't. So what should you do, trust it or not trust it? The answer is both. Trust it and not trust it. But how can you do both, trust and not trust at the same time? It isn't at the same time. It depends on the circumstance. So here's my advice for you. Well, before I get to the advice, let me tell you how your intuition can be wrong. Stored in your brain are all of your life's experiences. Things that have gone bad, mistakes that you've made, lessons that you've learned, but also stored up there are all the things that you've done that went really well with all the good outcomes, you know, all the training that you were in and you took the hose line in and you advanced it down the hallway and you attacked the fire and, and you had a successful outcome and you went in and you rescued the, the mannequin and brought him out and that's a successful outcome. All your successes are also stored in there as well. So sometimes when the brain finds the match, it doesn't always give you that feeling of doom or, or the hair standing up on the back of your neck or that knotted up gut feeling that something's gonna go wrong. Sometimes what it gives you is a feeling of bliss, a feeling of euphoria, a feeling of, wow, everything is going perfect. And I'm headed to the most beautiful outcome you could imagine. If you get that feeling, don't trust it. When you get that feeling of euphoria, that's when you need to pause and start looking for facts and data and proof and evidence to validate that you're not missing something because you're all caught up in the euphoria of thinking you're doing the perfect job. Let me give you an example of how, how this might uh, play out. Uh, let's just say um, you come home from work or, and uh, you sit in your most favorite comfortable chair at the house and you get the newspaper out and you open up the newspaper and you're reading the newspaper and off in some other part of the house your kids are ripping it up laughing and fighting and carrying on and from behind that newspaper you smile because life is good and then it gets quiet hmm What's that mean? Big trouble. Big trouble, right? <laughs> and if it got quiet, what would you do? Get up check. That's right. You're going to go investigate. You're going to get up out of the chair and you're going to go on to the search for proof and evidence and facts and data. So you might think, well, quiet means calm. Quiet means all is well. But as a parent, we know that quiet could, could mean trouble. So you get up and you get out in the hall and you go in the room where they were at and, and, and they might actually just be sitting there reading a book to each other like a couple little cherubs. <laughs> it could happen. But what's far more likely to happen is they're deep into something that they don't want you to know about, so they got quiet. And you knew that quiet didn't mean good, quiet meant the potential for a problem. Now how do parents know that quiet equals trouble? How do parents know that? Experience. What experience? From the children. Their experience from when they were kids and they were doing the wrong thing and they got quiet and all of a sudden some authority figure appeared in the doorway like magic and we got caught. 
So we learn those lessons intuitively and to know that when we have our own kids, we know that quiet can mean and often does mean trouble. Same thing for us when we're operating on emergency scenes. Quiet and calm could be, me, could be quiet and calm. They could be reading the book to each other or it could mean big trouble. So when you get that euphoric, euphoric, blissful feeling, look for the proof and the evidence, the facts and data to validate, and everything could be going really well. But just validate it, just prove it. All right, so let's demonstrate the power of intuition. To be able to do this, I need to have a volunteer. Now, as you volunteer, you can stay right in your seat. You don't have to come up to the front of the room or anything. And now let me tell you what the volunteer is going to do before you, you know, commit yourself to something that you're not sure you might want to do or not do. My volunteer has to be able to read. That's the only requirement. That's my disclaimer. You know, coffee or McDonald's on their coffee cup says this coffee is hot. That's a disclaimer. There's a reason it's there. If you don't know, Google it later and you'll find out. Why does McDonald's coffee cup say the coffee's hot? Isn't that intuitive, you know? No, there's a reason. The reason I say you gotta be able to read is I called on somebody once who was dyslexic. And they didn't do very well reading and they got, people laughed and they got embarrassed and I got embarrassed and it's like, no, Rich, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't call on somebody because you don't know, you know anyone's reading ability. So I'm just gonna ask if I can have a volunteer who will help me out by reading something that I'm gonna put up on the screen. Anyone, Bueller. Okay, you'll do it, sir. What is your name? John. John. Now, John, as you do this, I want you to do it out loud for everybody to hear. All right. Now, I don't have a microphone for you, so you're gonna have to, you know, belt it out there pretty good. All right. All right, John. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up on the screen 29 word problems, and you're gonna solve the 29 word problems. And when you get the answer, you're going to say what the answer is to the 29 word problems, all right? Now, there's nothing particularly amazing about the fact that John is going to solve 29 word problems. He's getting a pen and paper ready to help him out with it. Where it gets amazing is when I tell you that John is going to solve those 29 word problems in under 10 seconds. And he's not going to write anything down. How's he going to do that? He's going to do that using intuition. Pattern matching of stored information in his long-term memory and um, intuition, pattern matching, and, and, the, gut, and, and the, gut, the, the gut feel. His, his uh, knowing without knowing how he knows. So, John, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, when I put the 29 word problems up, you're just, you're just going to solve them uh, out loud. Now, there's two sides of your brain, John, left brain, right brain. Your left brain is your analytical brain, mathematical brain, critical thinking brain. That's the part of your brain that said, get a pen and paper, you're going to need it. Just turn that side of the brain off. You're not going to use that side of the brain at all. Your right side of your brain is your creative brain, your pattern matching brain, your musical brain, your artistic brain, your creative brain. I want you to turn that way up and use that side of the brain. Because, John, what I'm going to ask you to do is not going to make a one bit of sense to you or anybody in the room, but I just need you to trust me. When I put those 29 word problems up there, all I want you to do is say what feels like the right answer. Even if you don't know why you're saying what you're saying, you're just going to say things, and they're going to be right. <laughs> all right? Okay. Trust me? I trust you. All right. Here's John solving 29 word problems using pattern matching, intuition, and the 95% knowledge that resides outside of awareness. Do it nice and loud for everybody. Ready? All right. Read it. Read it. <laughs> According to research conducted at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters are in a word. The only important thing is that the first letter and the last letter are in the right place, the rest of the word can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. Bam! Give my hand! Woo! Woo, 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 woo! How could he do that? I had a young man in a program once read that about your age and I said, how could he do that? And the person sitting next to him said, well, if you'd ever read one of his incident reports, 
<laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd understand how he could, how he could read that, because that, that's how he writes. Actually, how he did that, you already know. We already learned it. So now we're just going to circle back to everything we've learned to this point, reconnect the dots, and make it all make sense. See, it all starts with inputs. And the inputs here come from light that is coming out of a projector that's on the ceiling. The light comes out of the projector, hits the screen, bounces off the screen, travels across the room, and goes into John's eye. John's eyes then take the rays of light, turn them into electricity, shoot them back into the brain, down to the destination of the Etch-a-Sketch, where the rays of light then get, the electricity then gets reconstructed as the images of the letters. Then, well, before I get to then, we need to, we need to stop and, and have an acknowledgement of something. So what is your first name? Tamara. Tamara. Tamara, I need to ask you a question. What letter is that? I. The letter I. But it's not the letter I to your brain. To your brain, it's a vertical line with a dot. You see, the brain stores and understands and comprehends and recalls everything as shapes and patterns and textures. The only way she knows that's the letter I is when she was a little child learning how to read, her teacher said, this shape, the vertical line with a dot, it has a name and it has a sound and it has a meaning. And when you take that shape and you add it to other shapes, they have new sounds and new meanings. And that's how we learn how to read. What we're doing when we're learning how to read is how to teach the brain that patterns and shapes have sounds and meanings. And that's the process of learning how to read. So as those shapes come into John's brain and onto the Etch-a-Sketch, the brain is not seeing jumbled letters. The brain is seeing a grouping of shapes. So let's just say that the grouping of shapes is this grouping here, making this word, and it, that snapshot goes up into memory doing the file search, big file search. Do I have a match to that grouping of shapes? Yes, I do, which is exciting for the brain. But wait a minute, it's not in order. And the brain says, ah, oh, it's all right, I can sort it out. It sorts it out and says, ah, I know exactly what that word is, which sends a message to the emotional control center of the brain because it's very exciting, which then sends messages down nerves, and those nerves end at muscles that control the vocal cords, and as fast as air could come out of his vocal cords, trusting me, right words were passing his lips. That's the power of intuition. If only we will trust it. Now, John, I want to thank you for helping me out. Now, I have, um, I've written some books on situational awareness, and I brought some along if you're interested. They're up, they're up here on the table. I'm going to give you one, John, for, for playing along and helping, helping me out. I've written five books on situational awareness. You can imagine there's that much to learn about this topic. And I brought along three volumes of them, volume one, two, and three. I'm going to give you volume one. And the reason I had to wait to this point in the program to give a book away is I had to make sure that somebody knew how to read my writing and the way I write. And uh, so we're all, we're all good, John. And catch me on the, at the lunch, and I'll sign that for you. We're building this house. We have the foundation, perception. We have the walls, understanding. Now we have to put a roof on this. And the roof, that part of situational awareness, is one of the hardest parts of the process. And it's where it goes wrong so, so often for us as first responders. The roof of the house, the highest, perhaps most complex part of situational awareness development is prediction. The ability to get out ahead of what is happening now and try to anticipate what's going to happen at some point into the future. How far into the future are we talking? That depends on how fast things are happening. At an incident where conditions are changing quickly, the future might be 30 seconds or one minute out. If the incident is moving a little bit slower, the future might be five minutes or 10 minutes out. If the incident's moving really slow, the future might be hours or days out. 
You know, as you look at, at some of the planning that they do in wildland incidents, they, they don't, like a structure fire, we plan a structure fire attack and what we're going to do in, the, in, in our first 20 minutes of arrival. You know, some of these wildland incidents are so large and so complex, they plan a, their, their uh, events in days. And day one, we'll get this done. And day two, we're going to get this done. So it depends on the complexity and the speed at which the conditions are changing as to how far into the future we do this level three situational awareness, the prediction. So how do we do it? We run some options in our head. So we say, looking at the, you know, taking the perception and understanding, got the puzzle, run a plan and say, if we do this, whatever this is that you decide to do, how's it going to turn out? And you kind of play that ahead in your mind and see how it's going to turn out. If it turns out well, then that might be the plan that you implement. If it doesn't turn out well in, in your thinking part of it, then maybe you won't want to implement that plan because you've been able to see a flaw in it before you even implement it. We sometimes call that forecasting. We sometimes call that making projections. Stephen Covey wrote a book, the number one all-time best-selling business book in the world. The book is called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'd recommend it uh, read for, for anyone. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a first responder training book, it's a leadership book. But it's a pretty good book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In his book, he talks about one of the habits that applies directly to the world that we operate in, and that is to begin with the end in mind. That's what he tells business people. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do something in your business, start the planning on the front end with what the end result is supposed to look like. So you know, you know when you reach it, that you've, you've reached the, the location that you were supposed to end up at. So for us in the first responder world, I would say the same thing. Begin with the end in mind. Start the operation with what the outcome should be. And what that does is it gives us a benchmark. It gives us a target. So say, for example, if I were to be operating in an incident scene, and I begin with the end in mind, and I say, where do I, where do I want to end up? And say where I want to end up is just hypothetically you know, uh, in front of the screen here. I mean, it, it's not always a geographic location. It, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's a, you know, just a successful outcome. But I'm just picking geography here for the example. So I'm here, and I want to end up there. So what I have to do is I have to figure out what do I need to do to get from here to there. Now, there is pretty close to us, but let's just say that that was some distance. And, you know, I'm, I'm say, in Wisconsin, and I need to go to Florida. Florida is my end destination. That's the end in mind. How do I get from Wisconsin to Florida? What routes am I going to take? Where am I going to stop off? The things I'm going to see? Where am I going to get gas? Where am I going to spend the night? Where am I, when am I going to stop and eat? All of the, the plans that help you to get to the destination. So I'm in Wisconsin. I'm going to Florida. That's my end goal. So you start then down the path of achieving the goal, trying to get to the benchmark, trying to get to the target, trying to get from Wisconsin to Florida. Well, along the way, we could end up detoured. We could end up off task. And if we're at an incident scene and we're supposed to be as an incident heading in this direction, we might find ourselves that we've veered slightly off target or slightly off course. Now, if you veer off course and you don't have a target in mind, you won't even realize that you're off course. It's kind of going on vacation. Where are we going to go? I don't know. We'll just drive the car. Wherever we end up is wherever we end up. You got to have the target to know whether you stay on course. You know, if you're in Wisconsin, you're going to Florida, and you've got a compass, it should always be pointing toward south. <laughs> At least you know you're going in the right direction. Starts pointing toward west, you got a problem. Keep the target in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So as you veer off task. You can pause, look, and say, where do I want to be? What's the outcome? The outcome's here. Am I heading the direction of the outcome? No, I'm heading west. I need to head south. Time for a course correction. Time to fix this problem before it turns to a tragedy. Time to turn and get back on course to the desired outcome. That's why it's so important to have that, that goal at the end that guides our actions all the way to the end. Another thing that we can do is we can ask ourselves some questions. These questions can really help us make some accurate predictions of the future. One of the questions we would ask is, where is this event headed? 
When you arrive on the scene, of, and every event is headed in some direction, and usually not in the direction of getting better on its own. You know, people don't call 911 when they do smart things. They call 911 because they got a problem and they need it fixed, and they call us. And our job is either to fix the problem or try to at least shift the problem into neutral so the problem doesn't get any worse after we get there. That's why they call us. That's, that's, the, that's the service that we provide to our communities. So we'd ask ourselves, where is this the event that uh, we, we've arrived and inherited, where is it headed? But the question does not end there. I want you to ask yourself, where is this event headed if we do nothing. Now I'm not advocating that as a strategy. I don't think you should arrive on the scene and do nothing. But imagine for a moment how it shifts your thinking if you said to yourself, we're going to arrive on the scene of this incident and do nothing but watch and see what happens. So the example that we'll use is a house fire. Let's just say an average house, two or three bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, a bath or two, a garage, maybe a basement, not attached to any other house, no exposure issues, you know, just an average house, and it's on fire. So when you arrive and you say to yourselves, as you're trying to develop your level three situation awareness, where is this house fire headed if we don't do anything? Now, if you have uh, uh, studied fire behavior, thermodynamics, and physics in any fashion of fire training, you know that that fire is headed in one of two certain outcomes. In other words, there's going to be one and or two things that are absolutely going to happen at every working house fire. The first thing that's going to happen is, if it hasn't happened before you arrive, is the fire is going to continue to grow and as the fire grows, it's going to make more heat. And as it makes more heat, things inside of the space that is on fire are going to start to heat up. And as they start to heat up, they're going to start to melt. And as they melt, they're going to start to give off gases. And those gases are smoke, and the smoke is fuel. And then that fuel is going to heat up to the point where the fuel is going to ignite. And we are going to experience a flashover. And then a free burning fire. If you arrive at a, if it hasn't happened yet when you arrive, you arrive assuming that there's contents in there and the house is not protected by a sprinkler and you did nothing but watch, you will see a fire grow to the point of flashover and free burning fire, right? The second thing that you're going to observe if you continue to do nothing but watch is as that fire continues to grow, the fire will eventually start to consume the components of construction. And as the fire consumes the components of construction, the building will weaken. And then the building's greatest enemy is going to try to kill the building. What is the greatest enemy of any building? Anybody know? Gravity. Gravity. That's right. Gravity is trying to kill every building all the time. Gravity is pushing down on the building we're in right now. If gravity had its choice, this building would be flat as a pancake. But the components of construction hold the building up against the forces of gravity. But as you heat the building up and heat the components of construction up, they weaken, and as they weaken, gravity wins, and as gravity wins, the building comes down. Flashover and collapse are the two certain things you're going to observe as an outcome if we do nothing. Now, here's the question I have for you. What do you think is the number one and number two killer of firefighters while in the act of firefighting at residential dwelling fires? Don't answer yet, because I have to put a little asterisk there. The number one killer, the number one acute killer of firefighters is heart attack. Indisputable. But that's in all circumstances. If a firefighter had a heart attack in a classroom, that counts. If they have it on the treadmill at the station, that counts. If they have it while they're having dinner, it counts. If they have it while they're responding to a call, it counts. And in all circumstances, heart attack is the number one killer of firefighters. Acute killer of firefighters. What's the number one 
chronic killer of firefighters over the long run? Cancer. Keep your gear clean. Wear your SCBAs. Shower after calls. Cancer will kill you in this job. Your propensity of cancer is infinitesimally higher than the average of our um, age and demographic group. So we're going to set cancer and heart attack aside because what I'm talking about are firefighters dying in the act of firefighting at residential fires. Number one and number two. Anybody want to guess them? Flash over and collapse. So here's what I'll tell you. Don't be inside when either of those things happen. Now you're thinking, that was a blinding flash of obvious, right? <laughs> right? But here's the thing. If it was so obvious, why is it number one and number two? It's obvious to, it's obvious to us in here because we're in a classroom. No stress, no consequence, no time compression, no screaming families, no peers expecting us to do heroic things, no media ca cameras other than the cameras watching us today. In a calm classroom, logic prevails and you'd say, yes, I should not be inside when it flashes over or collapses. But yet yeah, flash over and collapse are the number one and number two killer of firefighters in the act of firefighting at residential fires. And please, don't believe me. Just watch the casualty reports yourselves. Watch the announcements come out of firefighters that get killed in the act of firefighting and pay attention as to how many of them is some form of collapse where they're getting a thermal assault overrun by the fire and they're inside and it's killing them. How long is it going to take to get there. How long is it going to take for the fire to get to flash over? How long is it going to take for the building to get to the point of where it will collapse? There's a time element here. Every event unfolds at a certain pace, at a certain speed. Some events unfold very fast. Some events unfold very slowly. It's important for us to understand how fast these things are happening. How fast are conditions changing? Because we're going to have to make a decision of whether we're going to engage or not engage based on how fast the fire is spreading, how fast the building is decomposing. Therefore, we must pay attention to how time is passing. The passage of time is critical to the formation of situational awareness. In fact, so critical that I actually built it into the definition of situational awareness. Situational awareness is understanding, perceiving and understanding what's happening in the environment around you in context to how time is passing. If you lose track of the passage of time, you will by definition have flawed situational awareness. And compounding that is the fact that under stress, time becomes distorted. Your internal clock inside of your brain that teaches you how to, or show, that keeps track of your time passing, doesn't work so well in a high stress, high consequence environment. And experienced firefighters will tell you that they, there have been incident scenes that they've been on for 20 minutes and it only seems like they've been there for five minutes. Or they've been on the scene for five minutes and things are drawing out and it seems like, oh my God, we've been here a half an hour. We have to keep track of how time is passing to be able to have situational awareness. The final thing to do when we're, when we're trying to develop our level three prediction is to set some expectations. Those expectations have to do with what we think we can get done under the conditions that we've inherited. Can, the first question, can we change the outcome? That's a great question. Can we change this outcome? Can we shift this into neutral? Can we fix the problem? We want to. We train to. We take oaths of office to change outcomes. But can we change this outcome? For so much as your heart's in the right place and you're well trained, it doesn't mean you're going to change every outcome. It doesn't mean we're going to save every building. It doesn't mean we're going to save every life. We want to 
but we're not always able to. So we have to ask ourselves, can we change, can we change this outcome? Here's the thing I'll tell you. This comes right from the line of duty death reports. In fact, what I, what I tell folks in the program, I say, if you're going to write something down and you're going to take it back, this is it. And it's not even on any slide. Right from the casualty reports, I will say this. Don't get in the way of outcomes you can't change. That's what I see in the fatality reports. Firefighters getting in the way of outcomes they weren't going to change anyhow. They got in the way of a flashover, and the flashover happened anyhow, and they were in there when it happened. They got in the way of a building collapse, and the building collapsed anyhow no, without any respect for the fact that they were inside. Don't get in the way of outcomes you can't change. Because if you do, you'll become a victim of the outcome. Get in the way of a flashover that you're not going to be able to stop from happening. It's going to flash over and you're going to become a casualty. Get in the way of a collapse. You're not going to stop it. It's going to collapse. You become a victim of the casualty. Don't get in the way of those outcomes. Are the conditions right? To understand the conditions, we have to understand smoke behavior, fire behavior, building construction. We have to understand how conditions change as time progresses. That's all part of our essential training. Do we have the right resources? Do we have the right personnel? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right water supply to be able to get the job done now? Now, um, company officer, Madison? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. And uh, first name again is? Jerry. Jerry. When Jerry gives the answer to this question, Jerry, I want you to be honest. But in the process of giving an honest answer, it might sound like Jerry's being mean. Jerry's not being mean, he's just being honest. Jerry, as you know your crew, and you know your shift, and you know the Madison Fire Department, as you do, are all firefighters on the Madison Fire Department equal in knowledge, skill, Ability, fitness, and stamina. Are they all equal? No. See, he knows that. I hope he would say no, because that means he knows. We're not all equal. We all don't carry the same knowledge. We don't all don't have the same experiences. Some of us have got 20 years of experience. Some of us are brand new. Some of us do CrossFit. Some of us do not. Some of us are very... Uh, um, uh, deep into our training. Some do just the minimum. He knows that not everybody is equal in knowledge, skills, and ability. And when you're assessing your resources, you have to take that into consideration. Because on your crew, as you look at your crew and you say, I've got a crew of four, a crew of five. Do I have a weak link in my crew? And as you're assessing that, you're not being mean. You're just being honest, because if that weak link breaks, it jeopardizes the safety of the entire crew. So that officer has to take into consideration what that weak link can and can't do, and the fact that uh, an, in an inexperienced person is going to take longer to get it done because they don't yet have the experience. And it's not a thing of, it's not a thing of judgment to be mean. It's just a thing of being honest to say, can, how, how does the quality of our crew affect our ability to get the job done in the time that we have? If you have a highly experienced crew and you have a task that you know we need to get in, get it done, and it's going to be four minutes and that's all we have, and you've got a highly experienced crew, man, boop, boop, get in, get it done, four minutes. But if you've got a crew that is varying experience levels and varying fitness levels and you're honest with yourself, you might say, this, we, got, we got a window of time of four minutes. We're probably not going to make it because we don't have the right resources. When you find yourself in that leadership position with that scenario, take into consideration that if we try to get done what the experienced crew can get done in the same four-minute time frame, we could end up in a bad spot. Can we operate faster than the conditions are changing? 
And that's a factor of our resources, and it's a factor of how fast the conditions are changing. It's a factor sometimes of environmental things, like if the fire is wind-driven, you know, wind-driven fire is going to speed up the change of conditions. Can we operate faster than those conditions are changing? And the final question, how much time do we actually have to get our tasks done? We should never start into a task under changing conditions without saying to ourselves, I'm giving myself three minutes, four minutes. Or as an incident commander that the commander thinks to themselves, when I send this crew in under these conditions, I'm giving them a f X amount of time. And if they're not done in that X amount of time, I'm pulling them out. Because the conditions will have progressed to the point where we're now potentially in jeopardy. To be able to predict the future, you have to be able to use your imagination. Your imagination actually draws pictures on the Etch-a-Sketch. Not factual pictures, imagined pictures. Imagining three minutes out, five minutes out, eight minutes out. You're actually using your mind's eye, that's the layperson's term for the imagination, the mind's eye to try on the Etch-a-Sketch to see the outcome, to see the future before it occurs. So, summarizing the process of situational awareness development, level one, perception. The sensory inputs from the five senses. Level two, comprehension. Being able to use visual imagery, drawing pictures on the Etch-a-Sketch, doing the long-term memory file searches, sometimes triggering intuition, but not always. And then level three, forecasting using the imagination to try to anticipate what's going to happen before it happens. It is at the level three that I see most of the mistakes occurring. I see responders that are well trained and well experienced being very good at being perceptive of their environment, very good at conducting size ups, very good at gathering the information, very good at putting it together and understanding what is happening. Where, where I see it going off the track is when they, then once they figure out the problem, they start an action plan without trying to anticipate the outcome of the action plan before they start the action plan. All right, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to do a case study. The case study is a video of an incident that I'm going to show you where things do not go well. I'll just tell you that straight up. That's why it's my video case study. The, uh, I want you to both pay attention visually and audibly to the things that you're seeing and the things that you're hearing. And then, uh, uh, and then we're going to have a discussion about the video and the things that occurred in the video. As you're thinking about the video, I really want you to be thinking about situational awareness. Level one, perception. Level two, comprehension. Level three, prediction. You might be seeing things um, that are strategic or tactical that you might say, well, I think that was a mistake or I wouldn't, tactically, I wouldn't have done that that way. And that's okay if you're thinking about that. But when we have our conversation, we want to have our conversation about the situational awareness of these responders and, and where it was and was it strong or no, was it not or how did it, how did it go uh, in a path that they would have rather not had. And, and this incident does... Um, unfortunately and rather rather tragically um, so let's let's watch this video and then we're done we'll have a discussion Company's 1823 and 11, Fairfax Engine 439, Truck 11, Fairfax Squad 439, Ambulance 13, your second call, Battalion Chief 602, Response 6, Delta, Box 2203, House Fire 43238, Metalwood Court. Reserve Engine 6 allowed. We're on the same, got a two story single family dwelling. Got a fire, it looks like it's in the attic or run right inside Charlie. I'll get a situation report to you in a minute. Reserve engine 6 to tower 6. Nobody out here to me is going to need to do a search. 
Towers, okay. Reserve engine six allowed in situations. Go ahead. Two story single family dwelling. Confirming a working structure fire, number two floor. I'll go ahead and establish command. Need to transfer it ASAP. Okay, Battalion Chief 601, Chief 11, you direct on that. Excellent, sir. Now, safety 601, the call Metalwood Court is going to be for a work and structure fire. Okay. Okay, rescue 13, 13, 12. Chief 11, Toronto, same report, command. Okay, Chief 11, 13, 13. Chief 11, we want to go on the first day of all directing all your traffic. I'm ready to take me until you're ready to turn to us. Okay, thank you. Reserve engine 6. To the driver, start making some hires. See if it is in the attic. Medic 1-3 is on the scene, Sager. Okay, Medic 1-3-1. Keep loving the loudest. I'll go ahead and assume the name of the side out for the structure. Okay, Chief 11, I copy that. 13, 14. 23 to the Chief. Uh, give me a tiger situation. I didn't hear anything about one. We have their own water at the end of the port. I have another hydrant in front of 4324. Two, 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 in front of the Davis administration. Battalion 601 is on the same for me. Go ahead. Okay, Battalion Chief 601, 1350. Reserve Engine 6 to command. Any progress from the outside of your visibility is zero. After you were starting to get a hit on it, it looks like you still got heavy fire through the attic roof, man. Rescue 13 is on the scene. Okay, rescue 13, 13, 16. Safety 601, all set. Okay, safety 601, 13, 16. <laughs> 
You need you in there for red activation ASAP. Titan 6 1 to command, evacuate. Structure class rear, evacuate. Engine 18 on the scene. Down to Chief 11, did you copy everything? So I'm trying to get radio traffic. Command all out. All units operating fire ground. Evacuate structure ASAP. You have a RID activation from engine 6. It's in accountability on reserve engine 6. We got ladder is going to be on side A, David Quadri. Side A, David Quadri. I'm going to do it! My bike's on the car! I should really just tell that they're all the same. We'll be taking a risk. Command, all units, I need a ladder. 5 Charlie ASAP. I got a red activation in progress. Commander's are in six, your status. Commander's are in six, your status. I got units in the rocket. Did you see it coming? Why couldn't they? What was going on that kept them from being able to see the bad outcome in time to prevent it? This video is a gift given to us by the department where this occurred. They said, we want the world to learn the lessons. And it comes with a full after action review report. They took the video shot by an amateur, overlaid the fire department audio, so we could see everything that occurred. You remember me telling you that as I read those casualty reports throughout my career, I wondered how could they not see it coming? This is one of those examples. How could they not see it coming? Now what you saw in this video which maybe you didn't necessarily pay attention that close of attention. It was down at the bottom. There's a there's a clock. One of it one is the time of day, and the other clock is the elapsed time of the incident. And I cut this video, so you know, even though the video may have been like seven minutes long for you, it's you know a 15 or 16 minute video overall. But I just cut out the the parts where there wasn't radio traffic and such, so that we could just <clears throat> keep it short, so we'd have more time for discussion. But it really does beg to have the question asked, how could they not see it coming? In time to pull the crews out, take a defensive position, and not have a tragic outcome. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a break, another 10-minute break to um, you know, use the restroom or get some coffee. And when we come back from the break, we're going to have that discussion of why you think smart firefighters would not be able to see this in time to change the action to not have a tragic ending. So give some thought to that. Was there a complete 360 degree size up performed? And the answer is no. And when you think about situational awareness, is the first level of situational awareness is perception. 
And perception is gathering the information about what's going on around you. And if you remember from that very first slide, how do we form perception? Size up. Size up is the act of physically walking around the incident scene to see and hear what's happening in a first-hand experience perspective so that you can form the rest of your awareness. You know, the, the inputs from the perception get put together to form the understanding that allows you to make the prediction. No 360 size up. So, great takeaway lesson. No 360 size up. Your situation awareness, by definition, is going to have an impact. And they didn't do a 360 size up, which means some things were going on at that incident that they were not aware of. Would it have made a difference if they would have done a 360 size up at that incident? Absolutely. Absolutely it would. And we know this from the after action review that the fire started on the back side of the house. Now you saw a picture that had the, uh, the uh, deck and the, the, the walkout basement and stuff. That picture wasn't taken the day of the fire, so obviously there's not gonna be any, any uh, um, you know, fire activity in that photo. That's a realtor's photo from when the house was listed for sale and they had just gone around and taken a picture on the back, but they wanted you to see what the back side of the house looked like. Somebody had discarded a cigarette on that deck, or um, somebody showing the house for sale, I think it was, or the owner was showing it for sale, or they'd already moved out, they weren't living there. Discarded the cigarette, wind caught the cigarette, blew it back onto the deck, rolled it across the deck, and it went down between the siding and the decking, and there a slight breeze kept the cigarette burning, which then started the siding on fire on the back side of the house, and then the fire burned up the siding from the first floor to the, or, not the ground level, but the first, you know, the grade level, up the back side of the house to the second floor, up into the soffit and fascia, and on up into the attic. Now, you know from the information that you heard on the videotape that there's a high probability that they did not know that because they talk about there being a fire in the attic five times. Five times there's a mention of a fire in the attic. And not at one time ever is there a mention of the fire burning up three sides of the or three stories on the back side of the house, which, <clears throat> you know, you might say was an oversight that maybe they saw it and didn't mention it, but, you know, in the after action review, the officer started to do the size up but didn't finish it, got drawn off task and got pulled into the active firefight, and no 360 was done. No 360 of that, no perception of the fire burning on the back side, no understanding of it, no prediction of the future that this fire is going to uh, consume uh, the, the structure differently because it's not just an attic fire, which is what they think they're dealing with, which then flaws the awareness, which then flaws decision making, and you get to see things play out as you got to see them play out. So that lack of 360 has a very uh, critical um, connection to the situational awareness or the lack thereof at this, uh, at this incident, and many, and many in the casualty reports as well. In fact, as you look at the casualty reports, uh, where firefighters die in the act of firefighting, you will almost always see in there as a contributing factor non-existent or incomplete 360 size up. <laughs> in almost every one of the reports, and in this one as well. What else do you think was going on that might have influenced the, uh, the, the rollout of events here? See, we, we got the benefit of having a clock on the bottom of our viewing screen. There was no clock on the bottom of their viewing screen, and perhaps they, were, they could see the conditions changing, but were not conscientious of the fact of how the time was passing and how quickly those conditions were changing because they did not have context to time. And that is so critical to the formation of, of awareness, is connecting those two components of change over time. And that's, that's a critical part of it. And, and in fact, uh, we'll, you know, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later, and, and I'll give you some best practices for how to deal with some of these um, situational awareness challenges that we're, that we're identifying. Yeah, now, the, remember how I said, you know, part of the, the prediction of the, uh, or part of the um, uh, ability to develop situation awareness is begin with an end in mind, have a goal. 
So when you're at a house fire and it's, it's burning and you got black smoke, and as we're talking about the smoke, if we are going to begin this operation with an end in mind, that end or heading toward that end might mean something would happen to that smoke that would give us the indication that progress is being made. What would happen to that smoke that would be the indicator that we're making progress? Yes, the black smoke is going to turn to white smoke, indicating that water is being applied to the fire. And from basic fire training class, you know that one gallon of water, just one gallon of water, converted to steam, makes 1,700 gallons of steam. Just one gallon. So if they just get one gallon of wet stuff onto red stuff, there's going to be a whole lot of white stuff. And if you begin with the end in mind, and we arrive and we say, there's a lot of black smoke here. What do we want to accomplish? Let's turn that into white smoke. And then you start an action plan progressing toward the end result of, of slowing or stopping fire progression by turning black smoke to white smoke with steam from fire conversion, and time is passing by, and you don't see your end goal being accomplished, this means this is your end goal, and you are now going in this direction, completely not in support of what you want your end goal to be. Because you're not seeing any conversion, you're not seeing any progress, you're not seeing any extinguishment of the fire. Now there is the tiniest little bit of white smoke coming out the end of one of the uh, vents at the end of the roof, and you might have noticed just that little whiffing of white smoke coming out the end. I really do not think that that is smoke, or whites, or steam from water conversion. What I think that is, is I think that's the moisture that is being baked out of the attic rafters. You know, all the wood in that attic, it has moisture in it. And as you heat it up and it's starting to dry out, it draws the moisture out of that wood and turns it into steam. And I think that, that just tiny little whiff of smoke you're seeing coming out the end is probably that steam from the attic roof rafters being um, baked under the, the stress of the fire. But that's a, that's a great observation. I mean, you're probably sitting there wondering to yourself, when's this going to convert? You know, when is this? They're inside with a hose line. You saw that. At some point, this fire should convert to knockdown, right? But it never does. And they never stop and say, Ding! The time has come for us to stop doing what we're doing and go in a new direction and pull the people out. Because this is gonna, this is headed toward a bad outcome, and it reaches the bad outcome before they do that. Now, during the audio portion, the crew on the inside sends to the incident commander on the outside the mother of all clues that something isn't quite right on the inside. What is that clue? Zero visibility. zero visibility. Command, any progress on the outside? We got zero visibility in here. All right, what's that mean? That's code word for it's bad in here. We're taking a butt kicking. You see, when you're down at the floor level and you got heavy, thick, black, angry smoke down to the floor and it's so insufferably hot that you feel like you're burning up, that's not a good place to be. That fire is, that, that room is headed in the condition that is going to, that, that environment of zero visibility with high heat is pre-flashover conditions. And if you stay in those conditions, absent some intervention, it's going to turn into a fire. They call command, say, any progress from the outside, zero visibility in here. Now, why didn't command react by telling the crew to come out? First thing we have to give consideration to is maybe command didn't hear him say that. Simply because you heard it doesn't mean command heard it, right? Command might have been, been busy doing something else and wasn't really listening to the radio at that moment. 
or maybe the command's radio didn't work, or maybe that crew was on a different channel than command. There's lots of possible explanations why command might not have heard him say that at all. So we have to just, you know, give at least the, the thought to that possibility. And this is another thing. When you're looking at the, when you're reading casualty reports, the casualty reports will almost always have a radio log. At 90102, this was said. At 902.01, this was the reply. At 902.2, this was said. And you can read the radio log. Here's the first lesson for you. Don't assume that simply because it was captured on a recording device and then transcribed into an after-action report that the people on the incident scene actually heard that radio traffic. They may not have heard it. Simply because it's captured doesn't mean that anyone heard it. So maybe command didn't hear it. The only way we know the command heard it is the command replied to it. So once you know the command replied, we know that at least he heard that radio traffic. Now, the commander replied with three additional pieces, three pieces of radio traffic that command said in reply to, command, any progress from the outside? We've got zero visibility in here. And command said three things. Does anybody remember any of the three things the command said after that? One of them, you still got heavy fire in the attic roof vent, coming out of the attic roof vents. I got engine 23 going what? Engine 23 is pulling, a, pulling another line for you. And the third thing the command says is absolutely astounding every time I listen to it. He says, it looks like you're starting to get a hit on the fire. Did you hear him? Here's how it went. Command, any progress from the outside? It looks like you're starting to get a hit on the fire. You still got heavy attic in the roof and the attic roof vents. I got engine 23 bringing you another line. That's the sequence of radio traffic. And as I watch that and I hear command say that, I think to myself, how could he think that? How could he say that? There is no progress being made here. Why would he say that? That is a lie. I'm witnessing the incident commander telling a lie. The audio is overlaid to the video, time synchronized. So is he saying you're making progress? You're, we're seeing no progress. Because he wants to see it. <laughs> Hear what she said? Because he wants to see it. You remember that I told you this morning? If you want to see something bad enough, you will see it, even if it does not exist. And if you don't expect to see something, you won't see it. For example, somebody might have asked the commander, well, weren't you concerned about that heavy smoke coming out the front door? Wait a minute, front door? Fire's in the attic, above the second floor. If he doesn't have any thought that that fire is on the first floor, also, and it is, he may not even see the smoke coming out the front door because the brain says smoke coming out the front door for an attic fire doesn't make sense. Erase it. Just get it completely out of awareness. And he may not even see it. Even though it's easy for us to see on the video, doesn't mean that they, in the moment that he or she, the commander, is able to see it. That's a great observation. Who, which one of you said that? Yeah, nice. There are also a couple other barriers in play that could have affected the commander saying that. One is optimism. Optimism is a barrier to awareness. The belief that any, at any given moment they're going to make the conversion, that the black smoke is going to turn to white, and I'm just going to give the crew some encouragement and try to keep them you know, going on the task and tell them 23 is bringing you another line, keep up the good fight. So optimism is a barrier to awareness. So is denial. If you deny how bad things really are, you know, not being honest with yourself and saying, is it, it's not as bad as, I, is, is, is another fire that I've been on and it turned out okay, or it's not as bad as this one I was on and it turned out okay. So denial can be a barrier to awareness as well. But indisputably, you got to observe the incident commander saying something that clearly was not true. Now, the next question I have for you is this crew on the inside on the second floor has heavy, thick, black, angry, insufferably hot smoke 
bearing down on them all the way to the floor. They call command. In fact, it's so hot in there, uh, one of the people that survived said, he said, I wished I could have pulled the carpeting over my head. That's how hot it was. It's really hot in there. They called command, gave him the report, zero visibility. What do you think that company officer who reported that command, that the command, what do you think he might have been secretly to himself wishing or hoping the command might say to him in response to that? Get out. Get out. The command didn't say that. So they didn't get out. They stayed. Now the question I have for you is why would they stay? If it was that hot and they're burning up in there, why wouldn't they just turn and leave without being told to? He ignored his intuition. Perhaps. I haven't interviewed him to know if, he, if his intuition told him. It was beyond intuition. I mean, he was telling command, it is this bad in here. It wasn't just thinking how bad it was. He knew, he knew it was that bad in there. Why wouldn't he turn to his crew and say, let's leave? Might, might be construed as insubordination. See, is it, if it, it, that's a great observation because if you call command and you describe the conditions and you're thinking, order me out, order me out, and command doesn't order you out, command says, looks like you're starting to get progress and I got 23 bringing you another line, that could be construed as a thinly veiled order to stay and keep up the fight because I got 23 bringing you some backup resources. So if you left independently of command, it could be construed as an act of insubordination. I didn't tell you to leave, and there's a risk if you do things that are inconsistent with the desires of your superior officers. So maybe that's on the mind. What else could be an explanation as to why they wouldn't leave? So the crew on the inside thinks the command from the outside, paying attention to the big picture, has a is in a better vantage point to see the danger that we might be in or might not be in. But here's the fallacy in that. The conditions on the inside and the observable conditions on the outside can be very, very different. I had uh, the opportunity, in fact, Cameron, Cameron <laughs> come along with me. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina Fire Department had a firefighter fatality incident and they invited me down and Cameron came with me to help them figure out how it happened and to learn from it and figure out how to never let it happen again. And this fire was in the, in the fifth story of a medical office building. And from the outside, it looked like a non-event. It looked like a small fire that was being held in check by a sprinkler system. On the inside, it was terror and chaos because there was no sprinkler system. And this fire was actively growing and through the broken window, the smoke was not traveling because the smoke was moving into the overheaded voided space above them. And from the outside, non-event. From the inside, it was a horrid condition that ended up killing one of the captains on the Asheville Fire Department and almost killing more than, than, than him. So things don't always look the same from the outside to the inside. So the, in, the people on the inside have to defer a little bit to the knowledge of the person from the outside, but the person from the outside also has to defer to the knowledge of the person on the inside. So when it doesn't look that bad from the outside, the inside crew is saying, you know, it's hot and zero visibility, then that, has, that information command has to give some consideration to the fact that the crew on the inside might be in an environment that is not so obvious to the commander on the outside. So that's great observation. What else might have kept that crew from leaving on their own? The, the fire service culture is not one of run from danger, right? That's not how we train. That's not how we prepare. And in fact, that's why society looks at us with such reverence is because we are so willing to do those very high risk activities. That's why people hold us in such, such high regard because they know we do what they could never possibly do. So the culture can influence our decision making. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a barrier to situational awareness that I think might have been in play here. I don't know for sure, but I know for sure it has been in play because I've interviewed people who've been in the similar situation, took similar actions with similar outcomes, and they have made an admission to me. 
And here is that admission because it is a barrier to awareness. Why didn't you leave? I was afraid. Afraid? Imagine what it takes for a firefighter to admit they were afraid. And then I say, afraid of what? Because you would think if they were afraid of dying, they'd leave. It's not the fear of dying. It's a fear of something else. What? I will tell you. Let me take you off the fire ground for a moment and introduce you to a company called Gallup. Gallup does surveys. They survey people on all kinds of stuff. Like they'll go to the mall and they'll say, what's your favorite vacation place? And they'll ask people and then they'll publish the list of favorite vacation destinations for people who live in the Madison area. What's your favorite car? What's your favorite movie? Survey says, ding, lists. One of the lists in the Gallup surveys is called the fear survey. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid to do? Ironically, the Gallup survey has a pretty consistent result. The number one fear of people is, anybody know? Failure is a consequence. Doing, what are they afraid of doing? That's consequence. What are they afraid of doing? Making a decision. Public speaking. Public speaking. Fear of public speaking, number, consistently number one on the fear survey. You'd think they'd be afraid of dying. Fear of dying, number seven. Fear of public speaking, number one. Now you think about how irrational this is. That there are people out there that are more afraid of giving the eulogy at a funeral than being the person in the box. Now, we have to ask, what is it about public speaking that people fear so much? And some of you said it when I said it's a consequence. Now you can say it again. Embarrassment. Embarrassment. Failure. Failure. Ridicule. Ridicule. Consequence. Let's come back onto the fire ground. The firefighters are inside the fire. Should we leave? I don't know. I'm afraid. What am I afraid of? I'm afraid that if I come out, I will be judged as a failure, and I'll be embarrassed, and I'll be ridiculed, and there might be consequence. These are the kind of things that we don't talk about openly in our profession. Our bravado, our personalities, our machismo keep us from admitting the fact that we worry about what other people think about us. We worry about what our peers think about us. We work these 24-hour shifts with people who become our family. They trust us. We trust them. I don't want to let them down. And I know that if I do, there can be great, great consequences. I'll be embarrassed. I'll be ridiculed. I'll be criticized. I might actually even formally get into trouble. And when a person's mindset is gripped by that fear, <clears throat> they may continue to do what they know they shouldn't do, but they'll do it for the fear of, not the fear of dying, but the fear of those other consequences. And they'll stay to the bitter end or the near bitter end because they don't want to suffer that. And it ties to the culture. It happens. I see it a lot. I talk to a lot of first responders. I've, I've even done it myself. I will tell you that. You know, sometimes I think back to some of the things that I did you know, a, a, as an adult firefighter, and I'm thinking, holy cow, I behaved like a junior high schooler. I was worried more about peer pressure and what my friends would think of me than doing what was right at the moment and, and not being concerned about their opinion of me because I made the right call. I will tell you as a fire ground commander, I allowed crews to operate inside of fires longer than I should have because I didn't want them to come out and get in my face because I pulled them out by their opinion too soon. I was working as a chief in, a, in, in Ohio and uh, I was relatively young. I started as a chief there at 28 years old. Not, I don't recommend that as a, 
as a uh, as a way of uh, of his career path, but it's just how it worked out for me. And I'd been on the job a couple of years, and I had a firefighting crew inside of a house fire, a single story house. And the uh, the captain that was in there with the crew was uh, was a big guy, six four, could uh, could shadow the doorway if he was standing in it. And uh, he was leading the crew inside the firefight, and I was I was out at the street level, and it was time to come out. The fire, which had started on the first floor, had worked its way into the attic. I knew it had worked its way in the attic. I was giving them some time, but the fire in the attic was growing, and it wasn't. They weren't getting the knockdown, and it was time to leave. I told them to come out. Of course, you know what they do. They gave me pushback. Oh, we almost got it. Give us a couple more minutes, you know, which is of saying, you know, no, no, don't, don't pull me out. You know, we're, we're, we, we're, we're, we're fine in here. And I said, no, no, it's time to come out. I had to get forceful with him and I got forceful with him and he, and he come out the front door and he stood up on the porch and he tore off his face piece and his helmet flipped off and he saw me down at the end of the, at the end of the yard in the street and he comes stomping down that yard and I'm sure he was making indents in the, in the grass as he did it. And he come up and he got right up in my face and started pointing his finger at my chest. And he was screaming at me so vigorously he was literally slobbering on me. That's how mad he was that I ordered him out and saying these things to me. And as he's screaming at me, behind him, the roof um, weakened under the stress of the fire started to collapse. And it was like slow motion collapse. You know, it was just kind of like, sagging and sagging and coming down and down and down and down and i told i said to him turn around and look at what i was looking at and you'll understand why i told you to get out and he turned around and he looked and through that front door where they had just come out not even five minutes earlier there was nothing but burning roof rafters and attic material in that space just glowing red I said, that's why I ordered you out. What do you think he said to me? Nothing. nothing. That's right. He said nothing. For five years, he would not talk to me. I thought, thank you might have been in order. <laughs> I felt like I just saved a crew's life. No. He was bitter and angry because I ordered him out. I embarrassed him. Now, at that time, I knew nothing of neuroscience. I knew nothing of psychology. All I knew is I had done something that made him very, very upset with me. And he never talked to me again after that. Not for the balance of my time there until I left and went somewhere else to work did he ever talk to me. He would walk right past me. I'd say hello. I never stopped talking. I'd say hello and it kind of turned into a game for me, you know, just, to, you know, can I get one grunt or two today, <laughs> you know, and uh, that was it. I mean, it was, it was completely destroyed relation because he thought that I embarrassed him by calling him out in the middle of a firefight. And sadly, if I would have not held my ground and left him in there, that roof would have come down on that crew. And, uh, so I, I myself have also struggled on occasion, more than once, with that fear of embarrassment and consequence and ridicule that not just my peers, but my, the firefighters who would work for me, what will they think of me if I pull them out prematurely and the house burns down? Or what am I, what are, can you imagine the, 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 the challenge and the stress of having a crew inside doing an active search with a known victim and then it's time to come out and you have to order that crew out? That crew's not going to want to come out. And then you order them out, and then they come out, and in the process, the victim died. The criticism that you stand to potentially suffer because you ordered somebody out, what they might say prematurely, we could have got them. We were close to them. You made a bad call. That's always on the mind of how are we going to be judged by superiors, by peers, and by subordinates. That fear is real. All right. So we're going to, uh, for the balance of our time today, talk about the barriers that flaw awareness. We've talked about a few of them already. We talked about sensory conflict. 
We talked about mind drift. We talked about fear as a barrier, optimism, denial, tunnel vision. So we've, we've starting to amass a pretty good list, but I want to spend the balance of our time making sure we go over the big ones, the ones that can really impact your safety and survival. A barrier is anything that disrupts the ability to perceive or understand or predict or disrupts the ability of information to pass from perception to understanding or from our understanding to pass to prediction. Now, when I did my research, the, uh, what allowed me to earn my PhD was uncovering these barriers that flaw awareness. Everything that I've pretty much taught you so far, I did not discover. That was all information there. For, I, I kind of uncovered it in, for the benefit of the fire service because it was, it was living over in the world of military and aviation and medicine. And uh, uh, so I kind of brought those lessons that you've got this morning into the fire service world. But this afternoon, I'm going to share with you the original findings of my research that allowed me to earn that, that PhD. And uh, we're going to talk about a, a relatively small list of very dangerous situational awareness barriers. Now, there are a lot of barriers that can flaw your awareness, over a hundred of them. Think about it, over a hundred different ways your situational awareness can get messed up. So it's a very complex topic. But among that hundred, there's a small number of them that are the ones that are most likely to cause you harm. So well, if you understand, as you do now, the neural basis of intuition comes from the collection of life's experiences and that 95% of knowledge outside of awareness, <clears throat> it would stand the reason that that person with 30 years on has a whole lot more experiences on which to draw that intuition from to make the connections to fly the red flags versus somebody who is newer in, in the job. And in fact, and I'm really glad you brought this up because uh, folks that are new in firefighting or even new in law enforcement um, have to learn to manage their f natural fear responses. When you think about um, where, where our survival instinct comes from, it comes from heredity which dates back to cave dwellers which dates back to a time when when we walked the planet we were hunt the hunted you know, not the dominant species, and things wanted to kill us and eat us and turn us into lunch, and we learned how to survive, and part of that survival instinct is ingrained in us, which says that when you face a, a saber-toothed tiger, run. <laughs> Don't stand there and fight it. You run from it or hide from it. <clears throat> well, in modern day, the saber-tooth doesn't exist, but in modern day, the equivalent of the saber-tooth for us as firefighters is the fire. That's, the, that's the, you know, the big hairy thing with the long teeth that can kill us and hurt us. So our natural instinct is to flee that danger. So as new firefighters, we are taught how to manage the fear in training scenarios, and that's why they create those training scenarios as they are and get you used to facing those fears and dangers which then builds up a level of training and a level of confidence that allows us then to manage those fears. So it's not uncommon for somebody who's new at the business to think their, their intuition is telling them this environment's too dangerous, where in fact that's just their natural in, ingrained fear of things that can harm us. And over time you get training and you get experience. So if you have an experienced responder and a new responder, which of the two is going to have the potential to have more robust intuition? It's the experienced one. So the ones of us who are new should turn to those who have the experience and default and depend upon their intuition. Now what you hope is they'll trust it when it comes time to trust it and they won't trudge over it and, and do things counter to what their intuition is telling them. But the more experience we get, the more successful outcomes we have, the more likely we are to kind of trudge over our intuition. But if given the choice between somebody who is novice and somebody who's expert, you would, you would certainly rely on the intuition of, of the expert. I have to put a caveat to this though, because when you come straight out of school, 
all of your lessons are very fresh. And some of those experienced responders, for better or worse, have forgotten some of the things that are the lessons that are the freshest for you. So you may actually be able to tap into some knowledge quickly that they might not be able to remember. They may not be able to recall because your education is so recent. For example, if you were going to have to have a major surgery, would you want a surgeon who's been out of med school and doing surgeries for 30 years? Or would you want the surgeon who's fresh out of med school with all the most recent technology and recent practices and, and you know, fresh mind and fresh skills versus that person who's been at it for 30 years? I think different people would make a different argument of, give me, give me the one that's fresh out of school because they got all the newest, latest, greatest findings of science and, and you know, their, their, their education is the most up to date. Or somebody might say, give me the person who's been doing it for 30 years and I will defer to their, not their textbook knowledge, but their intuitive knowledge of how to, how to do that surgery. But all things considered, the experienced person is always going to have the better intuition. Whether they trust it or not is a whole other point of discussion. As the 30-year person, as t time passes, things evolve, building construction evolves, contents inside of houses evolve, and if we learn those skills back with a different technology when houses were stick built and things were you know, more class A materials versus the more modern, it really depends on how the person has evolved in their learning as society and construction and contents has evolved. In other words, as long as they have stayed a student of the fire service and continued to learn and grow, they would build on that foundation of experience of 30 years ago, but all along the way are realizing that this is a constantly changing profession. And it is. And we never stop learning. I have people that come to my class and I think to myself, how old are you? And I'll talk to these people and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm 65. How long have you been in the fire service? About 45 years. 45 years in the fire service and you're still going to school? Wow, that's a really important lesson for a lot of people in the room who've only been in this fire service for maybe four years and looking at that person who's been in 45 years and going to school. You know, it's, it's all a function, I think, of, of the mindset and the willingness to continue to learn. You know, one of the things that a wise person once said to me is in this business, you can have 20 years of experience or you can have one year of experience repeated 20 times. And it's a matter of how you want to learn and grow and evolve in your position. Those that learn and grow and evolve, their, their, their value to us is immeasurable. Those who choose not to, they're dangerous. So, well, you bring, first of all, you bring all your life's experiences in, in, into the fold. And so somebody, you know, somebody comes into, uh, say, a firefighting job. Oh, what did you do before you were a firefighter? I was a farmer. Oh, what's that got to do with firefighting? You'd be surprised how resourceful farmers have to be at critical analysis and problem solving and dealing with stress and changing situations. And you don't necessarily, unless you're a farmer, think of farmers' life as being stressful and complex, and it is. And as they learn and develop skills as to how to manage through those challenges of farming, those skills can have an application when you're on the fire ground. So all of life's experiences bring, bring lessons for us. But I do want to I do want to swing back and, and make one observation, and that is um, you, don't have to have, you don't have to be on the job for 20 years to get 20 years of experience. You don't. And I hope that, that I can explain this in a way that becomes very, uh, very um, encouraging for you as some of you are just starting your career out. What you choose to do over the course of a year will determine whether, yours experience, whether your experience is a year's worth of experience, a month worth of experience, or five years worth of experience. If for example, I just use Cameron as, as, a, as a case example here. Prior to Cameron ever serving as a career firefighter, Cameron went to Asheville with me 
and sat and helped me deconstruct an incident where a fire captain got killed and was part of the interviews of the firefighters who shared their experiences of what happened, how it happened, why it happened, the mistakes they made, the regrets that they had, and all the while, he was gaining experience as a firefighter, right? Learning what worked and what didn't and how and why. If you want to accelerate your experience level, the best way to do it is to become immersed in this job and not just doing it on shift, but reading, watching videos, taking classes, talking to smart people about calls that they've been on and the things that they've done and the places that they've been. And, and you know, if, I, if I were coming into the business, what I would do is I would turn to the people in, in, that I have access to that have gray hairs and I'd say, tell me about the biggest mistake you ever made on the job. And then I'd just listen. And for so long as they wanted to pass air over their lips, I would glean those lessons. And guess what? That's experience. Here's the thing about the brain, and I don't think I'll cover that this afternoon, is that your brain cannot distinguish fact from vividly imagined fiction. If it's fiction, but you vividly imagine it and believe it to be real, your brain stores it as a real experience. And it's very easy for your brain to be tricked. So, for example, you go to a movie theater, go to, go to a scary movie, and watch the audience. And, you know, the movie will be, it'll be a nighttime scene, 3 a.m., a group of, group of co-eds are having a slumber party in the middle of the woods. Don't know why, but they are. And there's a, there's a sound, and somebody says, well, I'll go see what it is. And they get up, and they go, and they open the door, and there's Jason with a mask and a chainsaw. And the audience goes, ah! Why does the audience scream? Ain't nothing coming off that screen going to hurt you, right? Your brain has been tricked into somehow believing that when he's done cutting them up, we're going to be next. We are in the scene. When we're training, when we're reading case studies, when we're watching videos, get into the scene. Immerse yourself in it. Make it real. Make it emotional. When you're reading a case, they, when you're watching that video like I showed earlier, don't look at it like you're some third-party observer from 19 states away. Say, that's, that's my crew in there. And I'm, I'm going to immerse myself and live this experience as if it were real. And the brain stores it as a real experience. That's why the more realistic a training scenario is, the more realistic the brain thinks and stores that as, a, as it really happening. Here's one of the things, when I became a new fire ground commander, you know, I went from company officer to fire chief. And, uh, and I didn't have a lot of experience at the fire chief level. You know, I had experience at the company level. Take the hose line through the front door, lead a crew to attack. Not big picture, stand back, command from the, you know, big picture point of view. I didn't have a lot of that experience, a little bit, but not very much. And I was you know, pretty underconfident about what I was doing. And here's what somebody told me to do. This is, again, way, way, way before I knew anything about neuroscience and how the brain functions and everything. He says, what you need to do, sounds like bad advice. He says, you need to start going around your town and burning buildings down. What? Well, not really burn them down. Just pull into a parking lot and look at the building from the perspective that you're the incident commander and that building's on fire and your first engine is going to arrive and imagine the smoke condition and the fire condition and the rescue scenario and give your, give your first crew an assignment and the second crew coming in, give them an assignment and literally manage the fire incident as if it's playing out. Hear the radio traffic, throw in a mayday now and then, throw in the hydrant broke, now do we, what are we going to do for a water supply? And burn these buildings down in your imagination. And you'll be building experience and confidence without ever setting, you know, match to fuel. And I started doing that. And, and lo and behold, I started going to fires, and it's like, I know what to do. I know what to do. I've already rehearsed this. I've already practiced this. I already know what to do in this scenario. I know what to do when, when the water, when the hydrant doesn't work. I've already, I've already practiced that one. 
I know, I'm, I'm skilled, I'm ready. Does it work? Well, I don't know. Let me ask you this. When Captain Sollenberger landed his Airbus A320 on the Hudson River, they interviewed him in the media. Now, anybody seen the movie, Solly? Anybody? Hands up if you have. Let me tell you something about the movie that you, as somebody who's seen the movie, wouldn't know. The audio component of what is happening in that cockpit is word for word exact to the black box recorder. That's one thing that Captain Sollenberg insisted on when the movie was made, because they said they told him, you know, we're going to take our Hollywood liberties with the movie here. So some of the things we're going to, you know, you're going to look at the movie and say that never happened. You know, that's Hollywood. We got to make it. Yeah, we got to make it so it'll sell tickets. And he said that's fine. He says, but everything that happens in that that happened in that cockpit has to be absolute 100% spot on accurate, and it is. I've heard the black box recorder, and it is word for word accurate. After that incident, Captain Sollenberg got in interviewed by the media. And somebody in the media said, how many times have you ever landed an airplane on water like that? You know, because he did it so flawlessly. And, and you would think that his, his answer would be, once. <laughs> and that's not what he said. He said, once in real life. Thousands of times in my mind. See, Captain Sollenberg, in addition to being an Airbus pilot, has had a hobby of being a glider pilot. So he was used to flying planes that were not under engine power with a glider. So basically that Airbus was a big glider once it lost both of its engines. And he, when he was gliding, always thought, how would I, if I had to land my glider on water, how would I do that? How would I control the descent? How would I control the nose up? How would I control what happens when the wings hit the water because you're going to have a rapid deceleration? He had all of that rehearsed in his mind before he ever actually had to do it. He told him, I've done that, I've done that thousands of times in my head. Figured out how would I do it if I had to. He had that one worked out already. And so when he had to, he started. He, they started a landing process that usually starts at 30,000 feet at 2,500 feet. And they were not controlling the descent. The plane was controlling its own descent under the force of gravity. It was just gliding to the ground and it was going to, you know, there, there was no keeping it airborne. It was, it was on its path. And uh, so they only had, as you know, just a few minutes in which to safely get that plane landed in the Hudson River. And he had that experience. I mean, when, when, he, when I heard that he had had that interview, I'm thinking, my God, I burn buildings down like he used to land planes on water. And you just preload those experiences by doing all of, the, all of those things. Vividly imagine yourself in those various scenarios. When you're in a, when you're in a training at a, at a burn building scenario, you should think every time, this is a real house. This is somebody's real property. This, 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 is not, this is not practice. This is game on. This is for real. And treat every one of those scenarios as if someone's life or death, including your own, depend on the outcome of your performance that one time, every time. And do it till you get it right. Make sense for you? Okay. All right, so any more questions? Let's talk about these barriers that block awareness. Uh, going to be it's the, just a handful of them, uh, but it's going to take us the rest of the afternoon to get through them. The first one is pre-arrival lens. Pre-arrival lens, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit already this morning. Pre-arrival lens is the picture you get in your mind of the call that you're going to based on the information that dispatch is sharing with you prior to arrival. So the pre-arrival lens is rooted in expectations. What do I expect to see when I get on the scene based on a picture drawn on my Etch-a-Sketch from the words of the dispatcher conveyed from the 911 caller? And then that helps you to set up what you think you might be doing when you get there. In, in fact, um, you know, as officers, what we would, we would do is we form our pre-arrival lens. We already start thinking about when we get on the scene, this is going to be our priorities, or the things that we're going to do, the things that I'm going to be giving to my crew assignment, uh, you know, maybe my 360. And you're doing all this based on this pre-arrival lens or pre-arrival expectation. 
The problem, which we talked about briefly, is sometimes dispatch doesn't give us accurate information. And it's not the dispatcher's fault. The 911 caller gave them bad information. So the bad information from the 911 caller comes to the dispatcher, which comes to us, which then has a bad or an incorrect picture painted on our mind. But it also then sets up expectations. So when we arrive on the scene, we may only see what we expected to see based on a picture drawn prior to arrival based entirely on secondhand information. You can see how this could end up being a challenge for us. Another problem with the pre-arrival lens is once we get this picture drawn on our mind as to the pro what the problem is, it can be hard to unlock from that picture. It's like the picture dries in quick dry ink. It can be hard to let go of it and imagine that the incident scene is something different than I, what I already know it to be. You're always going to form a pre-arrival lens, so there's, there's nothing wrong with that. What we have to realize is that it might not be accurate. And so we need to do some things just in case we get tricked with a bad picture. So here's some advice that I'm going to share with you. No matter when you're going to a call, no matter what you hear over the radio shared with you from dispatch, always end what dispatch says with the word maybe. You're going to a working fire, maybe. It's a two-story house, maybe. There are people trapped inside, maybe. Now when you're saying maybe, you're not doubting the dispatcher. You're doubting what the caller told the dispatcher, which is much easier to do because the dispatchers are sworn professionals and you think that you know they're going to give us accurate information. Well, they're only giving us the information as accurate as they know it to be. So when you're saying maybe, you're saying, well, there's a chance that that caller who told that to the dispatcher, who shared it with me, may not know truthfully what is happening. And they may not be accurate and they may be lying sometimes even on purpose. You know, I had a conversation with... Uh, with uh, Chief Langer this morning about the, the um, ballistic vests that the fire department has to wear on certain types of calls. And I was expressing to him my concern about wearing the ballistic vests on certain types of calls. Because how are we as company officers to judge which call is a call of threat and which call is not a call of threat? when I would say that every call holds the potential to be a call of threat. And I was sharing with him, I said, I was in a dispatch center once when they took a 911 call for a domestic violence situation, and the victim was the one calling 911, talking to the dispatcher, and I was listening in on another headset, and the dispatcher asked the caller, are there any weapons in the house? And the caller said, no, there aren't any weapons. And I thought to myself, if that dispatcher shares that with the officer, and the officer believes that to be fact, how foolish could that be? First of all, would the victim necessarily know that the perpetrator had not at some point brought a weapon into that house, but just didn't happen to tell the victim that they had a weapon in the house? How many things in a house, other than a firearm, is a weapon? Yeah, let me walk through your house and show you the weapons I can find. Baseball bats, steak knives, chains, all kinds of things are the potential to be a weapon. Are there any weapons in the house? No. She writes in the computer, confirm, no weapons in the house. This goes off on the MDT, off to the responding units, and I think, my God... Please don't believe what you were just told, that there aren't any weapons in the house. Don't buy it. Don't, please, don't paint that picture that you're walking into a safe scene because somebody affirmed to you no weapons. Every house is full of weapons, right? It's just a weapon of choice. <laughs> Some people think the only weapon is, is a, a firearm. No. I always say maybe. Conduct an original size up to improve the accuracy of your situational awareness, which means arrive on the scene and no matter what dispatch told you, conduct your own size up. When you get on the scene and you conduct a size up, that's your first time that you're ever really seeing facts. 
Everything else is second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand information. Gather your own facts. Gather your own information. Take your Etch-a-Sketch. When you arrive at the scene, take your Etch-a-Sketch, shake it clean, and fill it full of a puzzle pieces based on what you're literally seeing as facts, not what you were told, but what you were seeing. In fact, what you were told by the time you get there is most of the time old information. There are new facts. There's new information. The conditions are different. Avoid making premature decisions based on assumed information. This is something that I did as a company officer. I didn't know at the time how foolish I was for doing it, but I see now that it's not really a smart thing to do, but there's still a lot of fire departments that are still, still in this practice. Here's how this goes. I'm sitting in the right front seat of the engine, responding to a call, and back in the jump seat here is my crew. All right, so we're all riding along, dispatch is saying, got this, got this, da, 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 burning, da, 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 tra entrapment, da, 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 da. We're on our way to the call, and I would turn back to my crew and say, okay, you guys heard all everything that I heard on the radio. When we get on a scene, you pull an inch and three quarter line to the front door, you grab the irons in case uh, the door is locked, you throw a ladder to the second story window in case we need an ulterior means of aggress, and you catch the hydrant on the corner of, of street A and B. Okay, you know what we're gonna do? Great. We arrive on the scene, we got a plan. What can happen is we take that plan that we made before we were ever on the scene, before we ever gathered fact one, and that plan goes into action. And I see it all the time. And you watch them YouTube videos. You'll see the fire, the fire first and end fire engine gets on the scene. It looks like poetry. The line is gone, the ladder is gone, the irons are gone. And, you, and, I, and I think now, I would, 20 years ago, I would have thought, man, that fire department's got it all worked out. They must have an SOP that says, if you sit in this seat, this is your automatic task and your automatic task, because it's just beautiful, it's just poetry. And now when I see it happen, and I see that first engine pull up, and they get off, and they just start doing all these actions, I think to myself, man, I hope that beautiful plan fits the problem, because you got a great plan going here, but you didn't take time to figure out if the problem is going to be solved by that plan you're putting into action. Take a moment to conduct a size up and make sure that that plan is actually the right plan for that problem. Does that make sense? Don't get too caught up in the speed of having to take immediate action that you're implementing a plan that isn't going to fix the problem that you're dealing with. As a best practice to consider, have dispatch remind your first arriving to conduct the 360 size up. Some departments have policies that say, you know, you, have, you must do a 360 as so long as you're you know, physically able to get around the structure. Some just have it as standard practice. Some don't even have it as a standard practice at all. They just hope and wish that somebody will do it first in or second in. But because the size up and the gathering of the facts is so important is the foundation of situational awareness, it warrants the potential of having a best practice that says, Dispatch reminds our first arriving that we need to do a size up. Now, it doesn't have to be engine one, you're on the scene, remember to do your size up, because that might even sound a little parental, but it might be engine one's on the scene and dispatch says copy engine one on the scene waiting for your 360 size up. Bing! That reminds them, dispatch is waiting for it, so I better do it because I know they're going to, you know, somebody's going to circle around and ask if we did the 360 size up. Now, another best practice that can go along with that um, is that once an officer completes a 360 size up, that they actually announce on the radio that the 360 was completed. Upon completion of the 360, we, we have this and whatever that, and once they announce it, basically what it's doing is it's telling everybody responding to the scene, we did get the opportunity to do the 360. You know, we weren't distracted or we didn't shortcut the process or whatever. We went and we did the, somebody did the 360 and looked all the way around. That's what was missing in the video you saw this morning. If somebody would have done the 360, they would have seen fire burning on three, three floors. Now, let me help you understand how this not only can mess up the situational awareness of the first arriving crew who doesn't do the 360, but how it can mess up the situational awareness for other responders too. So let's assume that we have one, two, three companies, all right? This row is a company, a company, a company. This company's first on the scene, you're the officer, all right? 
Let's further assume that we have a standard practice that says the first arriving officer does a 360 size up. All right. So let's further assume that she didn't do the 360 size up. But when she got on the scene, she gave a windshield report and she gave a secondary size up, just like in the video, causing the second and third end to think the 360 was done. But it wasn't. But you don't know it because she gave two size ups. All right. So you and your crew go to work, not having all the information because the 360 wasn't done. What do you think the second end crew assumes? 360 was done. Third end crew assumes 360 was done. Well, surely if the 360 was done and there was a big fire burning on the back side of this house on three stories, the officer would have reported that, right? And since she didn't report it, a negative clue then sets an expectation. If there was fire burn on three floors, she'd have said it. And because she didn't say it, it's not happening. So this crew thinks no fire on the back side of the house. This crew thinks no fire on the back side of the house. Because if there was, the 360 would have captured it. We're not going to do another 360. She already did it. The commander arrives on the scene. I'm not going to do a 360. The first in officer already did it. All because the first in officer didn't then messes up the situation awareness for everyone subsequently coming in because everybody thinks they got an accurate size up, but they didn't because the 360 wasn't done. And that's, that's what happened in that video too. The, the chief officer arrived on the scene. They didn't do, a, they didn't do <laughs> in their words, I, well, I didn't do another 360. Emphasis on another. I didn't do another 360. The first in had already done it, but they hadn't. And he said, if I had known they hadn't, then I would have. They didn't know. Urgency. Urgency is a barrier to awareness. What causes us to feel the sense of urgency? From looking at the casualty reports, here's what I will tell you. The faster the conditions are changing when we arrive, the more likely we will feel a sense of urgency to do something quickly. In other words, you, you arrive and you don't have anything showing. You don't have a sense of urgency to get a hose line in or start a primary search. But you arrive on the scene and you got fire blowing out a window and it looks like it's spread into another room and you got a report of a victim inside and it's a fast moving fire with changing smoke conditions. You will feel a sense of urgency because you are under a time compression to get in and get the problem either solved or shifted into neutral or get that victim rescued because of how fast the conditions are changing. And as these conditions move fast, we get gripped by this sense of urgency. As I talk to responders and I say, um, why did you do this or do that or not do this or not do that? I can always tell when urgency was the barrier. Because when I say, why didn't you, da, 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 they'll say, there was no time to waste. That's how I know that they felt urgency. There was no time to waste to do this or to do that. There was no time, hypothetically, let me give you, there, a, a, a ladder needs put up to the second story window and, a, and we need to vent. There's no time to waste to put on all my turnout gear before I do this. Now, you'd never really see that happen, right? You've never seen a firefighter climb up a ladder, didn't we? Didn't we? That crew's advancing on the inside, and that firefighter's climbing up that window to break out that, climbing up that ladder to break out that window. For what purpose? Maybe to vent, maybe to make a secondary means of aggress for the crew operating on the second floor. But if the feeling is it has to be done quickly and because of the changing conditions, you might shortcut your best practice, like putting on your gear before you break glass and have it rain down around you. Avoid taking shortcuts, especially those shortcuts that come with forming your situational awareness and the process of how to make a good decision rooted in situational awareness. Don't shortcut that. Don't ever shortcut a size up. Don't ever miss the opportunity to figure out what the problem is before we start throwing around big, fat, hairy solutions. Figure out the problem first. That's not wasting time. That's investing time in your survival. 
avoid that mindset. There is no time to waste. Doing things that are best practice for the sake of our safety is not a waste of time. Overconfidence. It's a barrier to awareness. But what causes it? Before we talk about what causes us, just talk about confidence in general. Most responders starting out in this business, if their mind is right, should be underconfident, realizing there's a lot I need to know, and there's a lot I don't know, and therefore I'm not confident about what I'm doing because I don't know enough yet. Hopefully all of us start underconfident. And then we get some training, and then we get some experience, and as we get training and experience, we build our confidence level up, which is where, you know, I want every responder to be confident. But what causes some to drift over into that minefield of overconfidence? How do we, how do we make that transition from being a confident and competent responder to being an incompetent, overconfident responder? From looking at the casualty reports and from the interviews that I've done, I will tell you that this is how I see it happens mostly. Firefighters doing things that are less than best practice. Whatever we're learning is our best practices, they're not doing them. But they're getting away with it. They're doing something less than best practice and they're being rewarded with a successful outcome. When the brain is rewarded with a successful outcome, it remembers how to do it by that pathway. So as you shortcut and have success, what the brain learns is that shortcut is the way to success. And that becomes dangerous because we become then overconfident thinking, I don't have to do it the way I learned it in the academy. I learned a new and better and quicker way to get this or that done. And you do it, and it works. Now what happens when you do it and it works? What are you going to do the next time? You're going to do it again, and it works. What are you going to do the next time? You're going to do it again, and it works. What are you going to do the next time? Do it again, and it works. And every time you shortcut the best practice, and it works, you're gambling. Just like going to the casino and gambling. You're laying the bet down, and you win. And you lay the bet down, and you win. And you lay the bet down, and all of a sudden now, you got a level of confidence thing. I know how to play blackjack in a way that I win every time. And then you make the big bet, and you lose. Because the odds are always in the house's favor. The odds are always in the favor of the fire. And the overconfidence leads to the tragic ending. Don't gamble. The fire will beat you every time. Look, those casinos, just right past City Casino, I'll tell you a fact. Those really nice casinos aren't built with their money. They're built with the money of people who lose. The profits. Anytime you have overconfidence, another barrier that's going to come right along with overconfidence. Though it goes together with overconfidence like, like peas and carrots on a plate or turkey and mashed potatoes. It's really hard to have overconfidence without having this next barrier come tagging right along with it, and that is complacency. Complacency is a very, very dangerous mindset because once you get to the point where you become complacent, something happens inside the head that has a direct impact on your situational awareness. You see, I'll start a sentence and then we'll see if you can finish it for me. So anytime you, you think I know what I'm going to say, you just blurt out and say it ahead of me saying it. When you become complacent, you let your guard down. down. You let your guard down. What does that mean? When it lets your guard down, it means you're no longer paying attention which is the foundation of situational awareness. You're no longer paying attention to the dangerous things that can kill you. The dangerous things no longer look dangerous. That's how a firefighter can climb up a ladder without any turnout gear on and break out a window and have glass rain down around him and somehow think broken glass won't cut me. 
Why would a person think that broken glass won't cut them? Because, because it never has. You see, you find yourself breaking out enough broken glass without proper protection and you never get cut, all of a sudden you think that your skin's made out of a material that glass just won't cut. Glass is no less sharp, it's no less dangerous, You've just gambled and won and gambled and won and you get to the point where you become complacent and you don't see glass as sharp or dangerous anymore. You fight a fire to a successful outcome so many times you don't see fire as dangerous anymore. You think you've got a way to beat it every time. So we need to avoid created risk. There's two kinds of risk that we take as first responders. One is assumed risk and one is created risk. The assumed risk is the risk we cannot get rid of. It's the risk of doing this job. As soon as you raise your right hand, take your oath of office, get your badge pinned on, and get your assignment and get onto the street, there is risk that we cannot get rid of. No amount of training can get rid of all the risk. No amount of equipment, no amount of experience can completely devoid us of all the risk of this job. We try to minimize it, but we cannot eliminate it. This is a risky business and there's just a certain amount of assumed risk we're gonna have to accept when we do this but then there is the created risk there's a line and that line on one side of the line is the assumed risk of all the risk we just accept and then once we cross the line and we start the created risk we start to gamble we start to shortcut our best practices. We start to do things that are highly dangerous on the hope that it's going to produce a successful outcome. And now we're creating risk. We're making risk where risk doesn't need to be by doing things that we shouldn't be doing on the gamble that it is going to lead to the successful outcome that we have experienced before. And eventually, when we're creating risk, you go, to, you go to a casino, you lay your first dollar down, that's created risk. The assumed risk might happen when you're driving by it, you get in a car wreck because somebody hit you and didn't expect it. But as soon as you go in and lay your dollar down, you've created risk because the odds are built against us. Learn from our near-miss events. So many times I talk with folks in, in programs and I say, have you had a near-miss? Raise your hand if you had a near-miss. Three, four, five, six hands go up. Near-miss. Tell your story. Tell your story. They tell their stories about their near-misses. And then I had to stop, I had to stop asking this because the, the, outcome, the outcome of my question was so tragic. I'd say, what did your department do to learn and change from that near-miss event? Nothing. Nothing. We didn't change anything. Didn't do anything differently. Some of them are not near-misses. Some of them are fatality events. And I'll come in and they'll say, oh yeah, we had a firefighter killed five years ago. What'd you change after that? Nothing. Didn't change a thing. Didn't learn anything from a near miss or a casualty. A near miss is, think of a near miss as nothing more than a warning. It's kind of like a shot across the bow. The near miss is anything that if the circumstances were just slightly different, you could have a tragic outcome. Never let your guard down. Never ever, ever let your guard down. I don't care if it's your 17th fire alarm activation in the middle of the night at the Hampton Inn, don't let your guard down. I was at the Hampton Inn in a state that I will not name because we're videotaping. Middle of the night, fire alarm goes off. Now I had I, I was, the town I was staying in, I was not doing my training in that town. Although I had trained in, for that fire department, I was doing training in another town. I just happened to be staying in this, in this town. Fire alarm goes off. I get up. I get dressed. Halfway to the lobby, the fire alarm turns off. Oh, okay. Alarm reset. Well, I'm already up. I'll just walk up to the lobby, see what was going on. Walk up to the lobby. There's the clerk behind the desk. And uh, I walk up and I said, did, the, did you did reset the alarm? He said, no, I just put it on silence. Why did you silence that alarm? Well, because the manager tells us that if the alarm goes off at night, to silence it because we don't want to disturb the people while they're sleeping. Oh. All the while, while he's trying to have a conversation with me, he's answering the phone because the phones are ringing. Okay? Who's, call, who's calling the hotel in the middle of the night? 
Yeah, the guests in the room saying, is it really on fire? Do I need to leave? And he's answering, no, ma'am, false alarm. No, sir, false alarm. No, ma'am, false alarm. He's telling all these people it's false alarm. He don't know. I asked him, I said, before you silence that alarm, did you walk each floor to see if anything was on fire? No. I said, you realize how much liability you just caused for yourself? If somebody's on the third floor burning up and dying and you silence the alarm, well, sweat's starting to form on his forehead now, you know. He's, he's like a 19-year-old you know, college student just working as a clerk, and he's like, oh, don't talk to me like that. All the while, he still answers the phone. No, ma'am, false alarm. No, sir, false alarm. <laughs> and then I hear, all oh, the fire department's coming. This is going to get really interesting. So the fire department pulls up, and they pull up under the canopy, and the three firefighters that uh, come off the truck come into the lobby of the Hampton Inn with no turnout gear on. They're in shorts, sneakers, t-shirts. Hmm. Bad day for them, because Rich gasway has got his cell phone, and he doesn't let shit like that, I mean, he doesn't let stuff like that pass by. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm kind of, well, first of all, uh, on an iPhone, if, you're, if your speaker's on and you take a picture, it makes that shutter sound. And, the, and I didn't realize my speaker was on. I took the first picture with the shutter on. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Didn't want them to know I was taking pictures. And, but I'm taking pictures of these guys. The captain comes to the counter, and he's got the clipboard, and he's talking to the clerk. And, and the other firefighter is leaning up against the counter talking to the clerk. The third firefighter goes over to where they have the uh, urns of coffee, and he pours himself a cup of coffee and puts some creamer and sweetener in it. And he's standing there sipping his coffee, waiting for the captain to get the information from the report. They never walk any of the floors. They get the report. They go back. They, they attempt to reset. The, the uh, uh, fire alarm uh, won't reset. They put it in trouble mode, and they leave. Uh, I don't know what to do about this because I feel... Uh, a sense of obligation to say something because I know this fire department very well. I've trained with them. They're very passionate about their training. I go back to my room. I download the pictures. I send an email to the training chief and I say, it's time, I think it's time that you have, you put out something in a training bulletin about complacent mindset because let me tell you what I observed. And I told him about what I observed at the, at the Hampton Inn. And I said, you, you know, some, I hope it's not department-wide. It's a big department, too. I hope it's not department-wide, but you've got some complacency things that you need to address. I said, I'm not trying to get the crew in trouble, so don't, don't, you know, don't address it with the individual crew. Just put something out as a training bulletin. So that was on a Monday night. Tuesday, I go to class. I'm there all week. Tuesday, I go to class. Class is over. I'm driving back. My cell phone rings. I don't recognize the number. So I pull over, and I answer the phone. And it's the captain from the engine from the Hampton Inn call, calling me. And I'm like, oh, man, this is not good. And I'm like holding the phone out to here because I'm thinking he's going to let into me. And he says, uh, he says, I was the captain on the, on the call at the Hampton Inn this morning. And uh, he says, uh, when you get back, you'd send an email to the training chief. And he says, and the training chief called me and asked me for an explanation as to what happened. And I had no explanation. And he says, the reason I'm calling you is I owe you an apology. He said, last night you were my customer. And I was underprepared to serve you if that hotel was on fire. And he said, I'm calling to tell you that I'm sorry that I let that happen. And I'm like, wow. I really wasn't, expect I wasn't expecting the conversation to go that way. I was expecting it to see be somewhere between butt chewing and butt kicking. And... Uh, he says, how long are you in town? I said, I'm here all week till Friday. And he said, well, our next shift is Thursday. Would you like to come by the station and have dinner with our crew? Now, this is the crew that I just, you know, inadvertently ratted out, didn't mean to, but I did, and have dinner with our crew. And, he, and, I, and I said, yeah. And he says, but when the dinner's done, he says, he says, I want you to talk to us about complacency. I want you to, to you know, we need, we, need a, we need a sermon. And you're the one to deliver it. And tell us about how you see firefighters getting killed from acts of complacency. And, and for that, you'll get a, a free meal. I said, all right, deal. Because I'll never turn down the opportunity to talk about my, my passionate topics. So Thursday comes. I go to the station. They make this beautiful, beautiful dinner. 
of course, I didn't eat any of it because I figured they spit on my food. <laughs> and uh, no, I, no, I did. And we had, a, we had a wonderful dinner. When dinner was done, we ended up talking for about three hours about how complacency kills firefighters. And the reason I share this story is for two reasons. One, the captain and his entire crew were completely complacent. So was the clerk at the, at the hotel, which I think got addressed with the fire marshal. But the crew was completely complacent. But that captain, instead of becoming angry and defensive of his actions, realized what you did is you, you gave us an opportunity to fix a problem. And he was actually thankful for that opportunity that somebody, somebody in time took him by the collar and shook him and said, what are you doing here? This is not right. And uh, it, it, was, it was really a, a special opportunity to, to be part of that. Don't ever, ever, ever let your guard down. Confabulation. What does confabulation mean? Confabulation is a really odd word. Five syllables. Most people have never heard about it, but most people have confabulated at some time in their life without maybe even conscious thought or intention. When we're not the senior person on our crew, and our intuition tells us that maybe we're making a mistake or not doing something that we should be doing or we should be something different, doing different. How do we, how do we try to convey that message to our officer in a, in a respectful way, in a meaningful way, that they might actually then listen to us because especially as new firefighters, we come in, we come in with some experience, we come in with some background, but we're almost in the too new to rate category and it's very easy for someone to dismiss our intuition because we're not perceived as credible yet. So how do we, how do, we do that? So what I was telling some folks as we were gathered up here uh, on the break and having that conversation, uh, this, is a, this is the conversation that I had in my um, last visit with Cameron when I was coming down to do, do a ride along uh, at Station 7. I had an opportunity to have a conversation with his officer who, in, pri in private, was saying, you know, Rich, what can I do to, to get my firefighters to speak up more? You know, you've got the officer, you've got experienced driving, you've got two newer firefighters, and I just wish they'd speak up more. I just wish they'd share more about what they're seeing and hearing and thinking and concerns. And he says, you know, we just, they just, they're just like silent, you know, like they just don't, won't, won't say what's on their mind or what they're concerns are and he says and, and, and almost in a, in a statement of frustration he says I tell them all the time speak up speak up if you if you see something speak up if you're if you're concerned about something speak up if your intuition is telling you something speak up he says I tell them all the time to speak up he says but they don't speak up and I said it, it, this this it, it almost like the light bulb came on I said you say it but do you practice it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I mean it's one thing to say to somebody, if you, if you see something that is concerning to you, will you speak up to me? Will you? And you say, yes, sir. Yes. But when it comes time to do it, and I say, okay, go ahead, speak up. Tell me you think I'm making a mistake. Tell me that you think the decisions that I'm making might impair our crew and cause all of us to get killed. When you transition from the, yes, I'll do it, to actually doing it, is a very, very different experience. And what I suggested to him, I said, you gotta practice this. You gotta have your crew practice actually telling you they think you're making a mistake. And get them comfortable with sharing what they're thinking, what their concerns are, what their intuition is. And he says, uh, he says, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, I, I get it. He says, we could, we could do that. So we, we finish our chit-chat session, and we have lunch, and that afternoon we're going to do some, uh, they're going to, not we, they, are going to do some um, vertical ventilation practice. Yeah, Madison has this, this prop on a trailer that has some, some uh, uh, wood panels on it, and you can, simulate pulling up and putting the ladders up on the uh, panels and climbing up the ladders and practicing cutting holes as a vertical ventilation operation. So they've got this prop at the station and that afternoon they're going to do these vertical ventilation 
practice scenarios. So they set up and they do the first evolution, the truck pulls up, the um, lieutenant does a 360 around the prop like he would around a building, perfect. And the, the crew's getting off and they're getting a ladder and he says, okay, you guys take the ladder, put it here and uh, take the saw and go up, cut me a, cut me a four by four vent hole there. And, and uh, the, the crew, which my son is one of, they get the ladder, they get the, the ground ladder set, they get the, the roof, the hook ladder, uh, the, the roof ladder hooks up and up they go and up and yin, 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 got the hole cut, come down, do a little debrief, perfect, all right, let's, let's um, circle around, we'll do this again. And I get the lieutenant and I said, you remember what we were talking about this morning? And, um, about, you know, speaking up? And he says, yeah, I said, you want to see what it looks like in practice? He says, yeah, let's do that. So he's in on it. I said, okay. I says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have your crew speak up and tell you that they think that doing a vertical ventilation under the fire conditions that are here is a mistake. That if they go to the roof, they might get killed. And they're going to speak up to you. But I want you to stick to your guns about doing the ventilation exercise. And he's like, oh, this is going to be great. All right, so they pull the truck around again, and the, uh, the crew, the, the lieutenant gets off, he 360s around the house, the crew's getting the ladders, they're bringing the ladders over, and the officer says to the crew, all right, I want you guys to set, set the uh, ground ladder here, or the roof ladder there, cut me a four by four hole, you guys know, and, and they, they start setting the ladders, and I get the crew, which is Cameron, my son, and another firefighter that's been on about as long as you have. And I say, hey, the two of you, come here, come here, come here. And, they're, and my son's like, dad, we're in the middle of a drill. What the hell are you doing? Come here, come here. So I pull them off the task and I, and I got them there and they're just, they're anxious. They, don't, they want to go get that roof hole cut. They're like, what, what, what? And I said, okay. I said, stop, take a deep breath and tell me what the conditions might look like what the fire conditions might look like if you had concerns and didn't want to go up on that roof. What would those fire conditions look like? And they said, well, heavy black smoke coming out of the attic. Maybe active fire in the attic. Maybe the, the roof is starting to sag and we can see the roof is starting to sag. I said, okay, so I think what I hear you saying is, if you had heavy, thick, black smoke rolling out of the attic, active fire rolling out of the attic, and the roof was starting to sag, you would think that would not be an environment that you would want to go up on the roof and try to cut a hole. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. That's your conditions. Go tell your officer you don't want to go to the roof, and that's the reason why. And the other firefighter is saying, come on, Cameron, we got to go to the roof. So everybody's against him. Even the other firefighter, when we were in the circle, who said, you know, if those were the conditions, we wouldn't go to the roof. Once they faced the lieutenant, he wasn't having anything to do with it. He's like, come on, Cameron, the, you know, the heck with your dad's little game. We got to go roof hole. We got a roof hole. We got to go cut. And he was all in on going to the roof, even though he knew the conditions were such that if they went to the roof, that would probably collapse and they would probably go through. And Cameron, <laughs> I don't know why, what compelled him, but he held his ground all the way to the point where the lieutenant couldn't take, he was, you know, he was role acting, by God, kid, you're going to do what I'm telling you to do, come heck or high water, this is my order, you know, and he was playing along, oh, role acting it, which was a little odd because he says, that's not how I, I normally, he says, you know, I'd want to hear that input, I'd want him to tell me that. So when we, when, we, when we broke it off and we stopped it and I said, yeah, Cameron, how did that feel? And he said, that was the crappiest feeling I've ever felt. And I turned to the officer and I said, that crappy feeling is what you have to work with these firefighters to get them over. They can't feel scared or bad or intimidated or embarrassed to make those kind of statements to you. And until they get over that hump, they're going to do everything you tell them to do, even though they know better, because they don't know how to speak up. They've never practiced speaking up. You got to see the first time, as much as you've said, speak up, speak up, speak up. This is the first time you ever got to see somebody actually speak up. And you noticed how much he struggled with it. And the other firefighter didn't want anything to do with it whatsoever. 
If you really want them to speak up, if you really want them when they got that intuitive feeling that something isn't going right, and you want them to tell you, then you need to teach them how to tell you. Now there's a way to teach that, and I write about that on my blog, I've podcasted on it, about how to speak up when you think things are going wrong. So you can just swing by the blog and, and, and uh, you know, put in the search box, you know, how to speak up, or how to deny an order, or, um, and, and there's lots of advice about how to have those conversations. But those conversations really would start with the, um, in, in the firehouse. So to your question, say you get your assignment, you get to your station, you get your officer, let's just say they're, they're a solid officer. In other words, they're not, they're not gripped with a big ego and you know, they're balanced and, and they want, so they're, they're focused on safety, you know, everyone goes home, big component of their, of their thought process. And, 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 you're, and you're wondering, how do, I, how do I speak up to this person who's my first supervisor? Well, when you're all sitting around the coffee table, before you ever get the call, it might be a conversation of saying, Lieutenant, let's just say hypothetically, my intuition told me at an incident that something was going to go wrong. And it's based on my past experience of, you know, that I've gained in training somewhere else, or in the military, or a class that I took, or even from my basic recruit training. Would you want me to speak up or be quiet? I would bet any officer worth their gold would say, speak up, son, speak up. And then you might say, can we role play so you could show me how that might play out? Tell me how you would want me to speak up to you. Give me an example. I'll play you, you play me, have that conversation. Because I can guarantee you what they don't want you to do is get defensive and all up in their face about it and say, you know, you're going to get somebody killed if you keep this up or something like that. Poking them is going to make them on the defense. And there is a non-poking way to make your concern be known. In, in aviation, they got this figured out a long time ago when they started with crew resource management for, for, for airline pilots. Um, they created a code word in aviation. There's a, there's a four word code word in aviation that if anybody says this, it, it flies the red flag that something's going wrong. And it's simply, I have a concern. It doesn't matter whether you're a pilot, flight attendant, gate agent, baggage handler, air traffic controller, Anybody who says, I have a concern, those are the four trigger words that set a series of actions in the motion. So if you say to me, I have a concern, what I'm, if I'm following our policy, I'm supposed to stop and say, please tell me more. What's the concern? What do you, what do you, what do you see that I don't see? What are you worried about that I might be missing? Different fire departments have different codes. Uh, way back in my podcast, like within the first 10 episodes, a fire chief took this lesson. He went to his fire department and said, we need a code. We need, we need some kind of code that if somebody says that, we know, we know what you're saying. We know what you're trying to convey. What's going to be our code word for our fire department? Then he called me and he said, we got our code. You know, like in aviation, it's, I have a concern. He says, we got a code in our department now that if anybody from the newest firefighter straight on through has a concern, they say that phrase and we have to stop and give them the control of the, of the discussion. I said, oh, really? I said, what's your, what's your code? He said, actually, he says, we came up with the pigs are eating lemons. I'm like, what? He says, yeah. He says, that's exactly what we want the, the response to be. What? what? Why would you say that? That is such a nonsensical statement that it almost begs to say, tell me more of what you mean, right? The pigs are eating lemons. What's that mean? Well, as soon as you grab somebody by the collar and say, the pigs are eating lemons, huh? Let me tell you what I mean by that. This is what I see. This is what I see. Imagine if somebody went to the incident commander of that fire you saw that ended up with that tragedy, and they went to the commander and said, the pigs are eating lemons. What do you mean? Well, I mean, look at the smoke conditions. We're getting no conversion of smoke to steam. The fire is getting worse. The crews are on the inside. They've reported zero visibility. Maybe we should order them out and get them into a position of safety and call this house a loss. Yeah, I get, yeah, I, yeah, I see what you're saying now. But you know, you'd be so gripped in your action plan that you're not even seeing them, the, the tragedy that you're guiding the incident to. First of all, I would never suggest that anybody implement this in isolation. 
This is a conversation to be had department-wide. This is a standard procedure to be implemented department-wide so that everyone understands the meaning of the pigs are eating lemons. All right, so that when somebody plays that, somebody is not, by policy, you're not allowed to invoke the ego card. You know, my shoes are older than you, kid. You do what I tell you to do, and that's it. No, 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 no. You could have said that right up to the point I said pigs are eating lemons, but now here, here is a scripted set of procedures that fall into place now. In, in aviation, when it says I have a concern, there's a whole list of procedures that follow I have a concern that, has to be, that have to be followed. So the same thing for a fire department is you don't implement it in isolation between you and just your company officer. It's something the whole department has to agree to to have the mindset that anybody who has that concern can speak up. See, medicine does this too. In the operating room, anybody from the surgeon to the anesthesiologist to the orderly can raise a concern for something that they see going on that might impact the outcome on that patient. But everybody's on board, everybody knows about it. So when it's said, nobody gets angry or defensive about the person that are saying it, because that person is saying it with, with the righteous intent of, I'm trying to make sure that we all go home, and here's what this concern is. Now, in the end, it's whether that will lead to a change in action or not is really a decision of the officer or the commander, but at least you spoke up. At least you had the opportunity to have that concern be voiced. Now, your question was, over the radio or in person? Well, obviously, always best in person to get somebody privately and say, I have a concern, or the pigs are eating lemons, because basically what I might be saying in a private sort of way is, I think you're making a mistake. And when you say that in a public way, there's always the potential that somebody is going to get hurt emotionally and backlash as a result of it. So if the circumstances were right, always best to have that conversation in person, but sometimes the circumstances just aren't right that you can go out and have that face-to-face -face and you have to have that conversation over the radio. So the conversation might go, you know, command from engine two, go ahead engine two. Command, I got a concern because we're on the interior and we had a sudden change of conditions. We've got black smoke down to the floor, it's insufferably hot and I'm gonna recommend that, that our crew uh, withdraw from the building. Are you okay with that? Now what I've just taken you through is a five-step process. You don't realize that I did it, but there's, we, I just went through five steps of basically saying, I've got a problem, here's what the concern is, here's the conditions that I'm facing, here's my recommended action, may I have your approval to do it? And it's five, there's five steps to that, and it's all, I've written about it all on the blog. And taking through the five steps, and you get to the end and say, you know, this, this is what we want to do, are you okay with that? If that person is righteous in their position, they're going to say, absolutely, do, do it, because you've approached them in a non-threatening way, whether it's over the radio or in person. But again, it's something an organization does organization-wide, not in isolation. Because if you, talk, if you read the five-step, uh, it's called the five-step assertive statement process. That's what is, uh, is written about on the blog. If you try to invoke that without your officer knowing it, they're like, what, what are you doing here? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? You're, they wouldn't know. You know, people have to... If you're, gonna do, if you're gonna make something universal in the organization, everybody has to know and be trained on it. All right, confabulation. Did you look it up? No. <laughs> she, she started to Google it. He threw her under the bus and said, she can't wait for the break to be over. She's gonna Google it. I said, if you Google it, I'm gonna make you get up and teach it. She put her phone down. <laughs> said, okay, I'm not looking it up. Confabulation means your brain is lying to you. Your brain is making up its own reality. Now I told you your brain does this and it likes to do it all the time. In fact, your brain is so good at making up its own reality because of how often it does it. You, right now, are confabulating. And you don't even know it. How do I know it, but you don't? Let me tell you something about your biology. Inside of your eyes, you have nerves that gather the rays of light that allow you to see people and see around the room. But there is one point in each of your eyes where you have no nerves. It's called the optic disc. 
It's the point where all the nerve endings come together and it starts to send that information back into the brain. And where that is, there are no, there are no light receptor nerves, which means at that point in your field of vision, you are blind. Every one of us has a blind spot in each of our eyes. And if I had more time, I'd actually demonstrate that with an exercise where I could bring somebody to the front of the room and make them go blind. Well, they're already blind. I would just allow them to see that they are blind. You see, as you look out on the world, there is a spot about at this angle out of the left eye and about at this angle out of the right eye where you can't see anything because there aren't any nerve receptors that allow the light to come in from those angles. Yet as I look around the room, I don't have a black hole over here and a black hole over here where I should have black holes because I can't see anything. Well, if I don't have black holes, what is happening? Your brain is filling in the holes with what it thinks should be there. It's an active hallucination and you're doing it all the time. So like here, like say this is my blind spot and I say out of the, my peripheral vision I see my hand. If it's in my blind spot I don't see my hand. What I see is what should be my hand based on my brains making up my hand being in the blind spot. So maybe you've You've uh, been on an accident scene where a person will say, I don't know what it was, you know, they hit, a, they hit a bicyclist. I was just driving along and that bicycle came out of nowhere. Have you ever heard that said? Just come out of nowhere and they were right in front of me and I couldn't stop in time and I hit them. No, they don't come out of nowhere. They come out of the blind spot into the field of vision and then what you could not see because it was here in the blind spot is now where the nerves, where the, where the optic nerves are gathering the information and all of a sudden you see that bicyclist but maybe too late to not hit them. So our brain is always actively confabulating and making up its own reality and it believes what it wants to believe to be true which then you believe it to be true. Which means we are constantly living in a world of percepted reality, not true reality. Is perception reality? Hmm. Let's survey. Raise your hand if you think perception is reality. Hands down. Raise your hand if you don't think that perception is reality. Hands down. Here's a fact. Perception is 100% of the time reality. 100% of the time, perception is reality in the mind of the person who has that perception. See, whatever your perception of reality is, is your reality. Notwithstanding whether it is truly reality, it's your reality. And the only time you'll ever know if your perception was flawed is when true reality overlays your perception and then you can see the difference between what you thought was reality and what you now know is reality. Sometimes that doesn't happen until after the incident is over. Sometimes if we're lucky it happens enough, early enough in the incident that we can change our perception because we have a new reality. Be aware that in the absence of facts, the brain will make up its own reality. And be on alert for these differing perceptions. Let me give you a prime example of how your brain can fashion a reality on a fire scene. Let's imagine, like in that video, that crew did not do the 360 size up. So let's talk about one of the things that happens in the world of percepted reality when somebody doesn't do a size up. So, as we're arriving on the scene, as we're gathering information, we're gathering the puzzle pieces that we're going to put together to form our understanding that is going to allow us to predict the future, the whole process of situation awareness. But we shortcut the size up for whatever reason, and we don't do it. And the brain in this takes the information that it has, 
and sends it down the highway and puts it onto the Etch-a-Sketch. And lo and behold, there are holes in the puzzle because there is information we didn't gather because we didn't do the 360 size up. There will be holes in the puzzle of understanding. Right? Right? Wrong. You're like, oh, I had one chance to get a right answer. No holes. Because here's what happens. When that puzzle is snapshotted and there's missing information, the snapshot is sent up into memory. And when that snapshot is sent up into memory, what do you think happens to the holes? They get filled in with what? Silly putty? No. What? They get filled in with your past experiences based on what your brain thinks should be in the hole. That causes your perception of reality. No holes in the puzzle of understanding because the brain fills in the holes with what your experience is and tells you what you think should be there and you have a complete understanding of what is happening. That filling in process is called assumptions. When you make an assumption, what you are doing is filling in missing information with what you think should be the facts. So anytime, from here to evermore, doesn't even matter if it's on the fire ground. It, it could be when you got the family together for a, for a party or friends, and you say something, something, something. Oh, well, I just assumed that that, 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 that was the fact. If you ever say, I just assumed, what you're really saying is, I didn't know the facts, so I just made some stuff up and filled it in and called it fact good enough. That's what we're doing when we assume. We're, we're taking past experiences, bleeding them onto the current situation, and believing it to be truth or fact, and it's all made up in our mind. Multitasking. Who's good at multitasking? Anybody? No one? You are? Okay. Some people are. Some people think they are. Some people aren't and know it. Some people aren't and don't know it. Here's the fact. Your brain cannot multitask the act of paying attention. You can't pay attention to two things simultaneously. Whether they are two visual things, two audible things, a visual thing and an audible thing, the brain can't pay attention to two things at the same time. Biologically, not possible. How do we know this? Well, 20 years ago, we would have only been able to guess because we didn't have technology that allowed us to really see what was happening inside of a brain when a person is multitasking. Well, that all changed with the invention of a machine called Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, FMRI. And with FMRI technology, we're now able to peer inside a person's brain and watch what happens when a person is thinking or forgetting or under stress or multitasking. And what we see is amazing. Here's what we know. Let's imagine that uh, we're going to take you and put you in an fMRI machine and watch your brain function. So first thing we have to do is start an IV and stick some contrast in there so that when we watch this on the computer screen, we're able to see the different, different areas of the brain, different types of brain cells based on on density and electrical activity, and a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of stuff that I don't need to go into. But there's, there's your brain on the computer screen. And then we're going to do different exercises and watch how your brain reacts to these different things that we do. One of the things we're going to do is have you multitask. All right. So the first thing we do is we give you a task to do and say, do this task. And on the computer screen, we see certain area of the brain light up on the computer screen. Light up means that it changes colors and the color change means that, it, that those, those brain cells are functioning. Electrical activity is happening there, glucose is going there, energy is being consumed there, and that part of the brain lights up. So we clearly know those are the brain cells that you're using for task number one. And we might actually have you do that task and stop it several times to make sure those are the brain cells you're using for task number one. All right. Then we're going to give you a second task. Do task number two. 
and some, some other part of the brain, brain cells light up and then they go quiet and do it again, they light up and do it again, stop and go quiet. So clearly over here are the brain cells for task number one and over here are the brain cells for task number two. Then we're going to say multitask. Do both tasks at the same time. And what we know is going to happen is because she's multitasking, these brain cells are going to light up for task number one. And at the same time, these brain cells are going to light up for task number two because she is multitasking. And that is exactly what never happens. Never, ever, on any brain scan does that happen. So what happens? The brain cells for task number one light up, then they go quiet. Then number two light up, then they go quiet. Then one, then two, then one, then two, never simultaneously, alternating back and forth, but never at the same time. This is not what we expected to, to see when we had people multitasking, and what we realize is people can't multitask the act of paying attention. So uh, how fast does the brain alternate attention? Quickly. It only takes 25 hundredths of a second, faster than the blink of an eye, for the brain to shift attention from this task to this task. And 25 hundredths of a second to switch off of this task and back to this task. That's what gives us the illusion that we're multitasking, but we're not. We're alternating our attention between tasks. And you say, well, if it happens that fast, what's the difference? What does it matter whether it's, whether you call it multitasking or call it Donkey Kong? I mean, when it happens that fast, there's, it's really no consequence whatsoever. Well, that's what you think until you slow the process way down. Open this book up to any page that you want and read one sentence out loud for everyone. The term sometimes given to that is level of expertise is unconscious incompetence. Okay, all right, close the book. All right, so she was doing task number one, and I walk up and say, can I have a conversation with you? And she closes the book. And now task number two is having the conversation with me. The conversation is done. Please feel free to go pack the task number one. Open the book up to the exact page that you were on and read the very next sentence. Close the book, you didn't mark the page. See, and that's what happens. As our attention shifts from one task to another, we don't always make the note of where we left off on this task. You know, if you'd have kept your finger in the page, then she said, well, then I'd know right where I left off. If you made a note, uh, okay, I'm going to stop doing this and come over and give my attention to this. And then when I come back, I can look at my note and say, oh, this is where I need to pick up. Well, we, when we're alternating our attention, especially quickly, we don't necessarily put the notes on where we left off and where we should pick up. And that's when we start to have this forgetting and this meltdown when we're trying to multitask, forgetting what we've done, forgetting where I left off, forgetting what the next thing I'm supposed to do, forgetting where I left something. That's the risk of multitasking. You can keep the book. I'll sign it for you on break. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Realize that as you alternate attention, information will be lost. So as you're multitasking and alternating attention back and forth, you're very vulnerable to forgetting some of the things that you were doing or thinking you've already done something that you haven't done. <coughs> So one of the best practices is prioritizing and delegating. Now we're not always in a position where we can do this, but if we can, if you're doing a task, prioritize and make that task the, the focus and don't let something disrupt you. So for example, if I walked up to her while she was reading and said, can I have a conversation with you? She might say, wait, let me, wait a minute, let me finish the page that I'm on and remember the page that I left off, or you know, maybe even dog ear the page, and then have the conversation with me. That's prioritizing. Or delegating, if I walked up to her and said, hey, can I have a conversation with you? She would say, no, I'm a little bit busy now. I'll go ahead and talk to her, and, and she'll take care of your problem for you. We're not always in a position where we can delegate those things off to other people, but if we can, certainly that's one way to do it. For a company officer, um, prioritizing and delegating might mean that the company officer keeps their hands off of doing a task and lets the crew do the task while they maintain a big picture view and don't get caught up into the micro activity but stay, um, you know, keep the, the, uh, the priority on the big picture and delegate the hands on to the, to the crew. Short-term memory overload. 
When we talked about long-term memory this morning, we said long-term memory was huge, about 10 times all the information stored on the internet. Short-term memory, not nearly as good. The average person's short-term memory is equal to about seven pieces of unrelated information. That's it. Give or take two. For some people, they can remember about nine. For some, they can only remember about five. The average person can only hold about seven pieces of unrelated information in short-term memory. After that, we start forgetting. Now, what you might think is, when I'm in a high-risk situation and I've got a short-term memory limit, I'll remember the most important things and I'll let the least important things slip away. No, that's, how, that's a wish. That's not how it really works. Once the brain starts to prioritize, it can push some of the most important information that you wished you would have remembered off the plate. And then you might forget something that was really important and might remember something that was not important at all. But you remembered that. Respect the fact that your short-term memory has some severe limits. Try to focus on the most important information at an incident scene. So when you're operating an incident scene, there's lots of information, lots of data, lots of input. Try to, fo try to keep your focus on just that small number of the most important things. If you're in a, in a command level position, you can s consider using some memory aids like checklists and worksheets. Checklists, checklists and worksheets help to manage memory. The worksheet, we write down everything we've done so we don't have to remember what we've done. The checklist has everything we need to do that helps us to say whether we've, help us remember whether we've done it or not. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Oh, oh, I didn't, I haven't done that and, and I need to do that. Um, you know, for, for example, um, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a captain, now acting battalion chief in Indianapolis, just got his first, his, his first assignment, his first day on shift as a captain, acting battalion chief, first shift, multi-alarm fire with a mass casualty incident. First, first incident command experience. And I was looking at the pictures, and as I was looking at the pictures, we were looking at them last night, some of those victims at this apartment were on a bus. Remember that, Cameron? They were sitting on a bus. And that harkened back a memory to me when I was working as an incident commander at an apartment building fire in Minnesota in January. And we had the fire and I was focused on the fire and the firefight and commanding the firefighters and all the fire ground activity, completely oblivious of the fact that I am heading in the direction of having a mass casualty incident because all these people are standing outside in zero temperature, wearing pajamas and wrapped in blankets and some didn't even have shoes on their feet and I missed the fact that I need to get those people into a protected environment. I didn't have a checklist then. So when we got to where we made checklists, one of the things we, that we made in the checklist is, if you're on an apartment building and you evacuate the apartment building and the weather is in climate, be it excessively hot or excessively cold, call for a bus, check. Dispatch, send us a bus. And we bring the Metro bus in, and we put all the displaced people onto a bus. They can't go to another apartment building. That building isn't on fire. It's locked up. They can go knock on somebody's door at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, can we come into your apartment, hang out for a while? Order a bus. Ding! Now it's on the checklist. It must be on the checklist in Indianapolis, because Patrick had all those victims. And that fire just happened like two or three days ago, so it's cold in Indy. Bring in a bus so that we don't have the non-burn victims turning into victims of hypothermia. Time distortion. Time becomes distorted under stress. You have a mental clock that keeps track of time. If you weren't, if you were just living your life day in and day out, and you weren't really paying attention, your, your clock tells you when it's about lunchtime, it tells you when it's about dinner time, it tells you when it's time to go to bed. Your clock, even if you didn't set a clock, will alert you when it's time to wake up that you've slept long enough. I, that varies with age, I know that. Um, the time clock in the brain becomes distorted 
when we're under stress. Five minutes pass like 20 minutes, 20 minutes pass like five minutes. So if we know and can acknowledge that our time clock becomes distorted, there is a way for us to manage that. There is a best practice for that, and that is, as I had said this morning, to keep track of the passage of time. One of the best ways to do that is to have the dispatch give the incident scene elapsed time notifications. Calling the incident, the people on the incident saying, 10 minutes have passed, 20 minutes have passed, 30 minutes have passed. I know, I know in Madison that you, uh, on a certain benchmark, you get a notification from dispatch for a PAR check, right? At how, what, how many? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, all right? So at the 15 minute mark, while the commander is heavy into the act of commanding, dispatch comes on and says, you want a PAR check? Well, that does two things for the command. One, it says, time to check in and make sure you know where everybody's at and that they're okay. And two, oh, by the way, command, 15 minutes have passed on your incident already. Now, Chief, I'll bet you've been on incidents when dispatch called you and said it's time for your part check and you think to yourself, there is no way that 15 minutes have passed already. Yep. Whose clock? Yeah, right, whose clock, whose clock are you? Your clock and dispatch, it must be going like this. Because you get so involved in the actions and the activities and the thinking and the commanding and the hands-on things at the company level that time just is not one of those things that you're paying attention to. And when the time becomes distorted, awareness can be impacted. Auditory exclusion is a barrier to awareness. What does it mean? It means you're going deaf. Now, I'd said this morning, how could they not see the bad things happening in front of them? They are blind. Now I'm going to say they can also be deaf. And so can you be deaf at an incident scene and not even realize that you're experiencing moments of being deaf. How does it happen? It actually happens, there's a variety of ways that you can experience auditory exclusion, oftentimes induced by stress. The higher the stress, the more likely you are to experience auditory exclusion. Here's one of the primary ways it can happen. You might recall that I said that when audible messages come into your ears, they travel down the highway and get drawn into a picture onto the Etch-a-Sketch. Audible message drawn into a visual picture. An audible message into a visual picture. Audible into visual, audible into visual, audible visual, audible visual, audible visual, audible, 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 audible. What happens when there's too much radio traffic? What do you do? You tune it, who said tune it out? You, you, you mean you turn your radio off? The radio traffic becomes noise. Now when you think about that, one of the things essential to the formation of situational awareness is having an understanding of what is being said on the radio. Because a lot of times some of the most important things you need to know are things being shared over the radio and all of a sudden the radio has been relegated to be nothing but noise in your mind and you tune it out and you stop listening to it and all you hear is noise and as you're hearing noise essentially what's happening there first of all the ears are still working fine unless you have your fingers in your ears blocking the input sound waves are still coming into the ears still being turned into electricity still being sent down the highway but once the Etch-a-Sketch turns off the ability to turn that audible message into a visual picture, you don't understand what is being said at all. The message, it's like the door is locked. The message is not getting in. And if the message doesn't get in, it doesn't get drawn. If it doesn't get drawn, you have no understanding of what is being said. If you're, if you're in the presence of somebody having a conversation, they could be looking right at you, talking to you, and if your mind is drifted off task, you're going to hear every word I say, but not a word of it is going to mean anything to you because your Etch-a-Sketch is in another sphere. You've drifted away from the conversation. And then you might have, you might be going, you might even be giving me feedback, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll give you an example of where this happened. I was doing a program in, uh, in Colorado. And I had noticed 
out of the corner of my eye in the morning that one of the battalion chiefs sitting in the class had an earpiece in for his radio so he didn't disturb the class you know with with the radio traffic but I noticed this little you know curly curly cord coming up with the with the earpiece in and uh, somebody else had a radio that didn't have they must have been a company officer they didn't have an earpiece and the tones went went out for a call so the the officer who didn't have the earpiece just took his took his radio and he went up like this and he was listening to it and the battalion chief had his had his radio in his ear and and he and and and, and I can see I can see in his face he's not listening to me he's listening to his radio so I walk up to him and I have a conversation and I say things like you, you know your mother really dresses you funny and he's like mhm mm mhm mm and He's not listening to me. He's listening to the radio. And as soon as the radio traffic stops, I see him come back into the conversation. And I say, no, wouldn't you agree with me? And he says, yeah, I, I agree with that completely. He had not heard <laughs> word one. Of, and the whole class is laughing. And he doesn't know anything about the conversation because he was listening to the conversation in his ear, not in the conversation coming from me. But he was still giving me that positive affirmation of, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, like he's listening to me. No, not listening at all. When you start to tune it out, um, well, there is, there is a way that you can be warned that you're heading in the direction of auditory exclusion. If you're, if you're listening to the radio, and all of a sudden the radio starts to sound like, wah, 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 In other words, you're hearing like a noise that sounds like somebody saying something, but you can't really hear it, that might be a warning that your Etch-a-Sketch is not properly drawing the meaning of that message. Um, so that might, if you're astute enough, you might actually um, catch yourself experiencing auditory exclusion. So um, one of the things to do is, is to listen to the radio traffic and try from past incidents and try to determine what radio traffic is critical, essential and, essential and non-essential and try to cut down on the amount of radio traffic in general that we use on incident scenes. The more the radio traffic, the more likely um, it is that someone is going to experience auditory exclusion or tune it out or turn it into white noise. Uh, now, some of you have, have uh, lots of experiences with varying different fire departments, so I will ask, have any of you ever had the opportunity to be on an incident scene where somebody on that incident scene was radioactive? I mean, you couldn't shut them up on the radio. Anybody ex ever ex experienced that? Yeah. Why, do, why does somebody s feel like they need to just keep talking on the radio? There's a couple explanations. One, they just might be nervous, so they don't know, you know, they, they don't know how to say it, so they just keep talking and saying it. Another thing, which is a common fallacy, is that we tend to believe, if I want you to understand something, the more I explain it, the better you'll understand. The more information I give you, the better you'll understand. And in a calm environment, that tends to be true. But in a high-stress environment, that doesn't work that way. The more information somebody shares with us in a high-stress environment, the more, the more, the more, the sooner we just say, turn that off. I don't have time for that. Turn it into noise, and we stop listening. Use standardized terms and phrases. The fire service is pretty good about standardized terms and phrases. If somebody, if you, if somebody says vertical vent, you usually don't have to say much more than that. Somebody says primary search, you usually don't have to say much more than that. Everybody knows what that means. So having a common set of phrases where small phrases carry big meaning. Sensory domination. Listen very carefully as I'm about to explain something that can be very dangerous if not deadly for you and you'll never know that it's happening. Any, at any time, any one of your senses can dominate over any other sense. And when it does, it can turn the other senses off. If you're in an environment where there is lots to see and your brain perceives that you're in a threatening environment and it's therefore saying, eyes, pay attention to these threats, and there's lots of visual information in the process, 
that visual information coming in can take control and hijack the Etch-a-Sketch and all the other senses are turned off. You won't hear, you won't feel heat, you won't smell. Vision is dominating. The same thing can happen when you're listening. If you're listening very attentively to radio traffic that you perceive as critical to your survival, it can turn off all the other senses. I mean, your eyes are still open. It doesn't tell you to close your eyes. Your eyes are still open, but your eyes are no longer processing the meaning of anything that is coming in. So which, when it happens, whichever sense is dominating, it literally can like flip a switch and just turn off the other senses. And that domination can happen anywhere from a few microseconds up to 15 to 30 seconds at a time before it'll release and then allow the inputs from the other senses to then have their, their place on the Etch-a-Sketch again. Task fixation. When we become task fixated, we are focusing our attention to one physical task that we're performing. Advancing a hose line, starting a saw, setting a ladder, getting a fan in place, connecting to a hydrant, pumping the truck, whatever the physical task is, we're fixated on that task. And as we get fixated on that physical task, we're no longer paying attention to the other things that are going on around us. A lot of times, firefighters confuse task fixation with tunnel vision. They're not the same, and in fact, tunnel vision is an extremely, extremely rare phenomena. Even though a lot of people think they've had tunnel vision, they've never had tunnel vision. When you've experienced tunnel, if you've ever experienced tunnel vision, here's what you've experienced. You're looking at the world through a paper towel roll and everything else around you is gone. That's tunnel vision. If you're focusing your attention to one micro area or to one thing that you're doing, that's not tunnel vision. That's task fixation. Most of us who think we've had tunnel vision have actually, are actually experiencing task fixation. Being so fixated on one thing that we're doing that we're not paying attention to the other things that are going on around us. Task fixation, extremely common. The good news is we can control task fixation by practicing something called meta-awareness. The word meta means big picture. Having big picture awareness. In other words, as you're doing whatever task that you're doing, being at the conscious level saying to yourself, I'm doing this task, but it's not the only thing happening here. There are other people doing other things, and what they're doing impacts what I'm doing, and what I'm doing impacts what they're doing. In other words, the whole world isn't revolving around the fact that I'm advancing a hose line down a hallway, because at the same time there may be another crew searching, another crew vending, another crew doing this, someone else doing this, and what I'm doing is just one piece of a bigger picture, and being consciously aware of the fact that no matter how micro my task is, there are bigger things going on around that I need to be aware of beyond just my task. Make sense? Mission or goal? Myopia. Where does this come from and what does it mean? I borrowed the term myopia from medicine. If you are suffering from a medical condition called ocular myopia, this is what your field of vision would look like. Like a fisheye. And all you see is this tiny circle in the middle and everything else around would be blurry. Now I'm not talking about the medical condition of ocular myopia. I'm talking about the fire ground condition of mission myopia. Being so narrowly focused on the mission that we're not paying attention as to whether the fire conditions fit the mission. I'm on a mission to save lives. Shoof, that's my focus. Get on the scene, save lives. Wait a minute. Are the fire conditions right for that to happen? I don't care. I'm on a mission. You get so focused on the mission that you lose sight of the fact that that mission might not be supported by the conditions. Now, some would say, well, Rich, mission myopia and task fixation seem like the same thing. Well, they're not. The task fixation is, is a physical activity, hands on a task. Mission myopia is psychological. 
a commitment to the big picture strategic mission. Let me give you an example. The mission that I could get myopic on is saving lives. When I get on the scene of a fire, my primary mission is save lives, and that's what I'm going to do. If there's a life to save, I'm going to save that life, irregardless of the conditions. Mission, myopia. Task fixation might be, I'm going to go in on a left-hand wall search and search each room till I find the victim. I'm hands-on task level. Mission, save property. When I get on a scene, I'm going to save property no matter what, even if the conditions are not right. Task, advance a hose line through the door, go to the right, extinguish the fire. Mission, vertical ventilation. We're going to do a vertical ventilation to get on the scene. The mission is, ver I'm on a truck company. What do truck company people do? They ventilate. So we get on the scene, what are we going to do? Ventilate. Well, what if the conditions aren't right to ventilate? We're going to ventilate. <laughs> That's our mission. The task would be set the ladders, go to the roof, cut the hole. Mission myopia is actually taught and reinforced in our training. Really? Really. It is. You're actually taught to be mission myopic in our, in our well, I won't say you are because I don't know how you were trained individually. The behaviors can be changed, though, by teaching and coaching and practicing and mentoring. We need to teach firefighters the process of decision making. We do a really bad job of that in general. One of the two leading ways that firefighters die in the act of firefighting is collapse. In training, not even on my mind. You see, the brain remembers the lessons based on the training. So when you, in, when you, in training, if you're not thinking about collapse, and you get a real fire, guess what? You fall back on your training. No thought of collapse in training, no thought of collapse at the real fire. Because the scripts just play automatically at the real fire based on the training. And one of the leading ways that firefighters die at structure fires is Flashover, nowhere on the mind of the firefighter. Who should be making the decision about the hose line? The firefighter. the firefighter or the company officer. And based on what criteria should they decide the hose line? Building size, construction, amount of fire, hmm? Distance. Distance. No, 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 don't worry about that, Joe. Just pull that inch and three-quarter line, take it in there, and knock that fire down. And we do that with that inch and three-quarter line over and over and over again. And every time, every time, we're successful, right? Every time you were successful, right? Correct. Never failed. Every time, successful. Joe, let me ask you this. Now, I assume your crew had somebody in the role of, of an officer. Maybe it was another new firefighter and you took turns being the supervisor, but that crew had somebody who was maybe designated as the crew leader or something like that. At any time in any of those scenarios, when the fire was burning inside of the burn building, did you or your crew ever say, we're not going in this time? No. Nope. No go was never even an option. It was go every time. Now imagine the setup of this. Go every time with an inch and three quarter line, no concern for flashover, no concern for backdraft, or uh, collapse. Joe, prior to entry every time, every evolution, did you or someone on your crew do a 360 degree walk around the burn building prior to entry for every evolution? Everyone, no. No, every evolution. No. No. Now, what have we just observed based on training? No concern for flashover, no concern for collapse, inch and three quarter line every time, go every time, no 360 size up, and if we do those things in training, they become the automatic performance at real fires. So when we see firefighters hurt and killed doing those very things, we should not wonder why. We should ask, is that how they were trained? And in most cases, 
That is exactly how the training went. Who in here has done roof prop evolutions besides Cameron? I know that you have. Anybody here done a roof prop evolution where you got, you know, you, you're going to use a roof prop and you're going to cut a hole in the roof to simulate, you know, somebody give me a hand up if you've done that. Okay, so you have. Here, somewhere else, here. Did you, did you and your crew ever not go to the roof to do that practice evolution because the fire conditions weren't right? No. Never. See, that evolution that I took Cameron and his crew through, they'd never practiced that. They'd never, there was never no go. It was always go. Arrive, set the ladder, go to the roof, cut the hole. Arrive, set the ladder, go to the roof, cut the hole. Arrive, set the ladder, go to the roof, cut the hole. Show up at a real fire. Arrive, set the ladder, go to the roof, cut the hole. Automatic. Training mission myopia. All right, let's give you an example of this. This is an example of both task fixation and mission myopia. These both go together. This is a vertical ventilation example. Now, somebody else here had raised their hand that said they've done some vertical ventilation training and practice. So who was it over here? Somebody, somebody did my, okay. Y'all ever have? Okay. So what's your first name? David. David. Question for you, David. Let's assume I'm a civilian. I don't know anything about what real firefighters do. All right, just, just assume that. And I said, David, I was driving down the road the other day, and there was a column of smoke in the sky, and I thought, man, something must be burning. And I turned my, street, my car onto the street, and sure enough, there was this apartment building on fire, and I stopped because I wanted to see real firefighters do their brave work, and this fire truck pulled up, and these firefighters got in this basket, and this basket swung over to the roof, and these firefighters got off out of the basket and onto the roof, and, and I thought, man, that's, that's brave and, and really dangerous because this building's on fire. And I didn't understand why would they do that. So, David, I want, what I want you to do, and again, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm a civilian. I'm just going to ask you, why, why do firefighters go, go on the roofs of burning buildings? What is the purpose of this? And you would teach me by saying? You might be trying to uh, improve conditions inside for crews operating in there. How, well, how do they do that? Just by going up on the roof? Uh, they're going to cut a hole, let the heat and smoke out. They're going to cut a hole to let the heat and smoke out of the top of the roof. Yes, what do they use to cut the hole, David? Uh, it depends on the roof, but okay. chainsaw is... Okay, a saw. Yeah. Okay. And how does that improve conditions down below? What's going to happen that's going to make things better down below when they do this? Hot air rises, so as they make that hole, it's kind of like a chimney. Correct. And the heat and the flames and stuff just come up through the chimney which then, I guess, just improves things down below for crews and maybe victims? If done in a coordinated manner. Okay. I think I got it. David, I have another question for you. Can you tell me what that firefighter is doing on that roof right there? Totally making a mistake. Making a mistake. <laughs> Look at the judgment David is throwing around. <laughs> Probably making a mistake. You can see that from that angle? That those fire conditions might not be the right fire conditions to be on that roof? That's the kind of fire conditions that I was trying to talk Cameron and his partner into telling the officer, we shouldn't be up here. Guess what? This guy didn't say that. He didn't go to the officer and say, I don't think we should go up there. The officer said, go to the roof and cut that hole. Yes, sir. To the roof and cut the hole. David, what is that? Thick black smoke. Thick black smoke. And that is flames. And that is... Firefighter, and he is holding a saw. saw. So he's on the roof doing what you said firefighters do, going to the roof with a saw to cut a hole. Now, this is a photograph, and I will issue you a word of caution. Do not judge based on a photograph. A photograph is only a snapshot of an instant in time, and depending on the angle, you not even... Sh this could be photoshopped for all you know. So we shouldn't necessarily judge this. If only we had a video, then maybe we would see something different. We do have a video, and I shot it. And I was the person driving down the road on my way back to my hotel after a program. See a theme here? <laughs> I have an alibi. <laughs> and I saw a column of smoke, and I went, well, you know what firefighters do. Yeah, something's burning. I'm going to figure out, ooh. All these people were rubbernecking. I couldn't get within three blocks of this thing. <laughs> I had to park my car and walk up. 
and uh, the fire department wasn't even there yet, and this thing was rocking. And uh, so I started taking some pictures, and then you see the bucket truck here that, that pulled up. And uh, so the truck pulls up, and the firefighters get on the roof, and I get my phone, and I start shooting some video. Now, I will tell you, I had to edit the audio off of the video, because what I was saying is not appropriate for a classroom audience, all right? Uh, because I thought I was about to witness a line of duty death in person, <laughs> watching it unfold. So I was kind of trying to give them some encouragement from a distance. And of course, to them, I'm a civilian. I don't know what I'm talking about. They don't know me. I don't know them. So let's watch the video. And as you watch the video, I'm going to ask you all a, a few questions, all right? Um, some questions. So David, this person here, tell me what you think he's doing. Watch him. Watch him. What's he doing? Yeah, it looks like he's starting the saw on the roof. Okay, starting the saw on the roof. That's called task fixation, right? He's fixated on the task of trying to get the saw started. Now, he didn't fall through. He just, there's a split roof. He's, he just bent down. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you be so mission myopic to vertical ventilation that you may not even see how much danger you're in. Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. Could you be so mission myopic that you see how much danger you're in, but the Etch-a-Sketch isn't processing it and you don't understand how much danger you're in? Yes or no? Yes. Could you be so mission myopic that you see the danger, you understand the danger, but you choose to ignore the danger because we are on a mission. We were ordered to the roof and we're going to cut that hole. Yes or no? Yes. What should they do, David? Get off the roof. Look at that. They heard you. Just in time. Get off the roof. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're not done. We're not done. Watch this one here. He's almost standing in the fire. I learned in neuroscience school, there are nerves in the butt that feel heat. <laughs> Is that a garage? No, it's an apartment building with a victim trapped. All right, David, what you just observed, assumed risk or created risk? Created risk. Cross the line, right? All in the efforts of cheating the devil, making the gamble to try to have a successful outcome, of which I'm not sure what that was supposed to look like. Were they changing an outcome or getting in the way of an outcome? Getting in the way of an outcome. It's so obvious to us sitting here in the classroom, and we have to wonder why wasn't it so obvious to them that what they were doing was putting themselves in the gravest of danger without good reason. Now I stopped that video before the ending. The ending, there could be two tragic endings, two possible tragic endings to this video. The first most obvious tragic ending would be what would you have seen? They fall through the roof. The second possible tragic ending that you would observe would be what? They didn't fall through the roof. You see, both of them truly are a tragic ending, right? Because one of them has grave personal consequence, including the potential of death. The other outcome reinforces the complacent behavior with a successful outcome, thus teaching us this is acceptable. This is not acceptable. They got away with it. They didn't fall through. I'm glad. I didn't want to watch that. We started this program by me saying, up here is what we need to know about situational awareness. And down here is what most of us have ever been taught about it. And this is a knowledge gap. And what we did for you today is we closed that knowledge gap some. You learn things about situational awareness that in here won't mean nearly as much to you as when you get on the street. And when you get on the street, some of the lessons from the program today 
will start coming back to you and start snapping into your memory and it will start to all make sense and be extremely valuable to you in your safety and your survival. What my mission is, I'm trying to help first responders see the bad things coming, hopefully in time to avoid a bad outcome. I think as we close the knowledge gap and responders get smarter about situation awareness, we'll be better critical thinkers and better decision makers. And when that happens, we'll all be far more likely to accomplish goal number one. Always, always goal number one. Go home to the ones who love us. And that's what I want you to do now. Go home to the ones who love you. Thanks for sharing your day with me. I appreciate it. Thank you.